And Jessica, just a heads up, the magic number for quorum is 12 so that we can start the meeting, just so you know. That's that's what I'm looking for in the participant list. Okay, that's factoring in Senator Dibble. Yep. Okay. Thanks. Factoring in that he's not here, correct? Correct. Okay. Correct. Sorry, I'm still eating. Well, I think also in calculating any supermajority, right, it's because we're it's, everyone's going to have the option to vote. That's a voting member through... Yep, so it'll still be 22. Yep. And I do 21. just. Because I, I thought it was 22 with Senator Dibble, but he resigned. So that would make our. We, our... Have, we have the Republican senator now who is oh, supposed that, to what... be here and is supposed to vote. So we will have 22 total. But oh, today. Yeah, today, that's what. That was the last I heard. I don't, I mean. Yeah. Based on how things are going, uh, who knows? Yeah. And then, uh, Jessica, oh, on the... Oh, excellent. <laughs> Good morning, Mark. Good morning. Morning. Thank you for joining our task force, Senator Corrin. My name is Jessica Nielsen. I'm the task force chair. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Just need to get caught up in where you guys are. Oh, yeah, not nothing like uh, jumping into the fire. And it's good to see you again, by the way. We were together over on the ORAC board, I think, for a while. Oh, for sure. Yeah, good to see you again. Um, Jessica, I was just giving you a heads up, too, if you hadn't spotted it on the mural, um, that we do have a cheat sheet for what the calculation is for a supermajority. Uh, if you're on there, just look for my my cursor. It's wiggling around that spot. Yeah, I saw that last night. Okay. Oh, good. Okay. I was grateful because yeah. I was trying to think of how to visualize that and put something on mural. And it was. I like, know. I, I know. Yep. Yep. So I think that will be handy for us. Now, question about <clears throat> those totals the 22, like we have that set up for the supermajority to be that's if we count all votes if we don't count abstentions we'll have to adjust that figure yeah i figured we could just sort of recalculate that like as it comes in and this just sort yeah. of what more than 50 percent for that and again oh. we're we're going to be missing at least one person's vote today so have to keep remembering that Morning, and, Arnie. Morning, Rep West. Good morning. Good morning. And this is Stacy. I've got about one minute before we begin, can begin, but uh, we, we need more members coming in. So it might be that we'll have to wait just a few minutes Jessica, before we can begin, is that all right with you? Yeah, sounds good. Morning, Rep Smith. Morning, Jeremy. Morning, Kari. Is anyone getting a message uh, when you tried to join the meeting that the meeting hadn't started yet? Because Caroline There's, is a uh, Kit is in the room and she's getting a message that says the host has another meeting in progress or something like that. Let me drop off and come back. I'll, I'll leave the meeting going. All right, we're sitting at 11 people. We need one more for a quorum, everyone. It's just a lot. It's, I, didn't, I didn't get that message when I came back.
Kit is in the room with me, um, but having trouble joining the Zoom. I'm sorry, who is Nick? Kit O'Neill. Ah, okay. So that would put us at 12. Jessica, I'll, I'll wait for a cue from you if you want to wait for a little bit longer or go ahead and start. What's your preference? Yeah, I mean, it looks like we have a quorum if we want to get to business. Otherwise, we can give it a few more minutes to let people join if we know that everyone's going to be joining today. Most well, how about we get started because there's just some logistical stuff we need to cover anyway. Okay, that's good. very good. All right. Well, welcome everyone. If you are looking for the Minnesota Psychedelic Medicine Task Force, this is the right place at the right time. We're glad you're here. Um, we've got just a few uh, housekeeping details that we like to go uh, through at every meeting. Um, Jessica, I don't know if you want to pull up those slides when we get there, um, but I'll just start rolling through some of the basics. There we go. Uh, uh, members, uh, especially today when we're having conversation, sure is helpful if you are able to keep your cameras on. Um, there's some um, cheat sheet information for members there on the screen right now. We try to use our raise hand feature um, uh, when you're wanting to speak. Uh, we don't have the chat function going, so like no use looking for it. It's not going to be working. Uh, and if you're not already on the mural members, go ahead and get on. Um, remember, you, you need your password to get on. That should be in the email that Jessica, Jessica Burke, our Jessica, sent out ahead of time. Uh, if, uh, if that's problematic for any reason, our Jessica, Jessica Burst, who's got her hands on the controls, does a really good job of sharing her screen so you can see what's going on. That's also important for you if you're viewing this meeting that will show you what we're doing. Um, observers, uh, welcome. We're glad you're here. Uh, the meeting, uh, as you probably already know, is being live streamed on uh, YouTube. Uh, and uh, when we're done, the summary of the meeting will be posted on the task force website. Uh, and just another word about Mural, it's really just a working space where members can uh, type in their thoughts. We can move a little bit more quickly. Uh, it just is a good tool for us to keep focused and the members can also go back up in the mural and look at past meeting information. It's like all in one space. So it's very helpful to them. Uh, you as members of the public, however, are not able to get into that space. It's password protected, which is why our Jess is sharing her screen so you can see what's going on. Um, and then uh, just a bit of a reminder about the purpose of this task force. Jess, I think there's a slide specifically for that, actually a couple of them. If we can go to that. There we go. So the legislative charge for this group is that the Psychedelic Medicine Task Force was established to advise the legislature on the legal, medical, and policy issues associated with the legalization of psychedelic medicine in the state. For the purposes of the work, psychedelic medicine means MDMA, psilocybin, and LSD. And there's a bit more information here. Our duties uh, are to um, uh, consider scientific research. Uh, and I'm going to read these because this is an important meeting today. So I'll just ground us, uh, all of us. Uh, number one, survey existing studies in the scientific literature on the therapeutic efficacy of psychedelic medicine and the treatment of mental health conditions, including depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, bipolar disorder, any, any other mental health conditions and medical conditions for which psychedelic medicine may provide an effective treatment option. And number two, compare the efficacy of psychedelic medicine in treating the conditions described above in number one with the efficacy of treatments currently used for these conditions. And we've got another screen or another slide, if you will, Jess. The duties of this group are to develop a comprehensive plan that covers statutory changes necessary for the legalization of psychedelic medicine, state and local regulation of psychedelic medicine, 
federal law, policy, and regulation of psychedelic medicine with a focus on retaining state autonomy to act without conflicting with federal law, including methods to resolve conflicts. And then there's a whole bunch of information about mm, federal codes. Oh. And then finally, uh, education of the public on recommendations made to the legislature and others about necessary and appropriate actions related to the legalization of psychedelic medicine in the state. I think that's the last one, but check me if I'm wrong, Jess. Yeah, there we go. All right. So with that, um, uh, Jessica Nielsen, our chair, and I will go through some uh, logistical business that we have to do at the start of every meeting. Uh, and uh, perhaps, Jessica, do you want to start by just talking through the group what the, the agenda is? And then I'm just kind of pausing to make sure we get as many people here as possible. We know we've got a, a quorum, but then I'll do roll call. How does that sound? Yeah, that sounds great. Thanks, Stacy. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, so thanks, everyone. Thank you to the task force members for joining. I know this is a big meeting today where we're going to be voting on our final recommendations. Um, but like Stacey said, first, we need to um, do some logistical business. So first, we need to approve our August meeting um, minutes. So hopefully everybody received those ahead of time and had time to review uh, so we can vote on whether to, whether to approve those meeting minutes from August. Uh, next, we're going to go around and let the different members of the task force share um, collected feedback that they've gotten from their respective communities or state agencies regarding the work that we're doing. Um, then we're going to talk about a little bit about how we're going to go about voting for our final recommendations today and open that up for discussion um, just to clarify and make sure everyone's on the same page about the process that we're going to do today. Then we're going to go ahead and officially vote on the six recommendations that have been put forth to each of you um, to make a vote today. And then we'll close out the meeting talking about our task force report and how that development's going. And uh, Caroline will be kind of taking the the reins on that to try to solicit more volunteers to help us write and edit and review this massive report that we need to start working on um after this meeting so um yeah stacy what what's next on the agenda do we want to go ahead well, and uh, move to approve the minutes well first we need to do that official roll call so i'll go ahead and do that and then this group knows the drill then we're going to turn right around and do a, a second uh uh run here to approve the minutes from the august five meeting. Just can I jump in here for a second? Of course uh, we you have can. several members who are having trouble getting in. So uh, ah. Helen, Adam, Paula, Ooh. and Courtney are all having difficulty getting in. So um, okay. I don't know if you want to stall or just go ahead and I'll keep working with them. Um, well, let's just pause here and check. Is there a hey, benefit? Jess, to maybe have them try the calendar link. That's what I've told might work better than okay. the Okay. I was having link. the same problem. I was using the link that you sent out, but if they go to their calendar and try it that way, they'll get in. Excellent. All right. So then let's, Jessica, let's just give it a moment. That's a good group of people. Not a good, you know what I mean. That's a big group of people. I want to make sure that they're, they're here. So let's just give them a second to hear that message and get situated. Thanks, Jill, for that information. Appreciate it. And good to see you. Oh, thank you. So to those that might be observing this meeting, we're just pausing for a moment so that we can get some more members in through a different mean. There was some glitch in the system. Yeah. Anybody having issues uh, getting into Mural? I've tried it on three different browsers and I'm just struggling to get in. Did you use the password, Guthrie? Well, I can't even get the link to get going. Just okay. giving me the spinny wheel of death. I'll keep trying. <laughs> I was just wondering if others were having the issue too. Apparently not. I didn't, I didn't have any issues. Which you tried it on a couple search engines. Yeah. Is there a, a state preference used? Just not uh, Explorer, if that's even a, a, a feasible options anymore. They don't like each other, but most people don't even have that on their systems anymore. So. Right. Okay. I'll keep looking. Okay. I don't know what's going on. Thanks. It shouldn't be an issue, Guthrie, until late in the meeting when there is a place for people to um, put in their thoughts. So if you want to keep poking at it, you should be okay by the end. And, and we can come up with a workaround on the second half of the meeting if it's still a problem for you. Looks like Helen's joining.
everybody was on the same email. So they all, so if Helen got in, hopefully they'll yeah. all use their okay. calendar invite and get in. All right. And Jess Burke, I think I'll wait no. for a cue from you when you think all of those folks have made it in. And welcome, by the way, everybody that's joining us. Looks like Adam has successfully joined. We're just waiting. Yay! Out. I'm here. Sorry. Courtney, I don't know what happened. Adam. No oh. worries. We're just... Courtney. Yeah, Courtney and Paula. Okay, let's just give it another minute. Thanks for your patience, everyone. We just want to make sure that everybody's able to get in. Uh, and if you're um, observing this meeting, uh, the silence you've been hearing is us just giving time for members to get through some logistical or technical challenges to join us today. Hey, Paula. There's, yep. Excellent. So I'm just waiting on Courtney, you said? I think so. Yes. Funky process with the Zoom today. Uh, just, it's never dull, is it? We sent the link and that did it, so. Great. Yep, we're just waiting on Courtney, everyone. There, there we go, there she is. Excellent. All right, we're good. And Jessica, shall I go ahead and, and do roll call? Yes, thank you. Okay, here we go, everyone. Courtney Amundsen. Here. Oopsie. Uh, Helen? Bassett, Helen? Yep, good morning. Yep, here. Good morning. Guthrie Capicello. Here. Paula DeSanto. Here. Jeremy Drucker. Here. Hey, Jeremy. Stephan Egan. Here. Margaret Gavian. Here. Murray, Margaret. Uh, Bennett is absent today. We knew about that. David Hung. David's absent too. Am I correct in that, Jess Burke? Yes. Yep, you're correct. All right. Uh, Senator Mark Coran. I'm here. Welcome, Mark. We'll do a more formal welcome and onboarding in just a moment, but I'm glad you're here. Uh, Nick Leonards. Here. Good morning. Ari McHenry. Here. Jessica Nielsen. Here. Kid O'Neill. Yeah, sure. Uh, here. Hi, Kit. Jill Phillips. Here. Sorry about that. Good morning. Where's the button? Where's the button? <laughs> Ken Sass. Here. I can. Donovan Southern. Here. Hi, Donovan. Uh, Andy Smith. Here. Michael Tabor. It's Michael, 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 Michael. Is Michael here? I don't. Let's see, Michael. All right. Uh, Adam Tomzik. Here. And Ranji uh, Fergies. Ranji. I don't Ranji. see him on the participant list. Oh, okay. And uh, Nolan West. Present. Very good. Thank you. And we have quorum, and I'm going to do that whole thing all over again now. Um, uh, after uh, Jessica calls for a motion to approve and second the minutes, then I can go ahead and do that. So, Jessica, back over to you. Yeah, thanks. So, assuming everyone has read the August meeting minutes, um, if folks could, um, if there could be a motion to approve, uh, to vote to approve the August meeting minutes, do I have a motion to approve the minutes? Um, do we have a second? Do I second? All right, two things. So moved, so we'll move on to um, voting for the meeting minutes. Is there any um, point of discussion that folks want to make around the, the meeting minutes from August? Anything you want to uh, modify or discuss um, before we move on to voting to approve them?
All right, hearing none. Um, and just know that if you weren't at the August meeting, um, you're free to abstain uh, from voting because uh, obviously we wouldn't be able to check the um, the accuracy of the meeting minutes. So um, I'll turn it back over to you, Stacey, and we can okay. go ahead and do that. Very good. I'm going with first names now to speed things along. Courtney. Helen. Excuse me, abstain. Guthrie. Approve. Paula. Approve. I'm going with first things along. Courtney. Approve. Oh, we've got some feedback going, I think. Bronji, you're here. Sorry, everyone. For some reason, I did not attend the, uh, I didn't go through the link on my calendar Paula. and I just connected. Yep. You figured it out. That's great. Yep. I just put you down as present and there's somebody that's giving me some feedback. I'm not sure where. So check your, check your settings and put yourself on mute everyone, if you would, please, until we get that sorted out. Uh, and I'm back up on approving the minutes from the August 5th meeting with Jeremy. Uh, abstain. I was absent. Uh, Stefan. Abstain. Margaret. Approve. And Bennett's gone. Uh, David's gone. Uh, Mark. Abstain. Nick. Abstain. Ari. Approve. Jessica. Approve. Kit. Abstain. Nick. Jill. Abstain. Oh. Ari. Approve. Okay, see, now I'm getting that weird Just feedback again. Does anybody know? Approved. Hey, Raji, can you put your um put your mute on, would you, for a second? There it is. It's something. Ranji, it's something with your, I'm not sure what's going on, but I'm getting some feedback when you're on, like a delayed feedback. So you might want to just check into that. I'm going to keep going through this list though, but I need to double back and, and make sure I got a few things right. So I'm going to go back up to Jessica. Jessica, I'm pretty sure you said approve. Approve. Yep. And Kit, did you say abstain? I said approve. I said approve. I said approve. See, there it is. Oh, Kit, it's that yours. That was on our end, we're sorry. That was on our end. It's my yeah, it? it's in the room. Okay. All right, Jill. Approve. Thank you. Ken? Approve. Donovan? Approve. Andy? Approve. Michael? Oh, Michael's absent. Never mind. Unless he's here, did he come in? No, he Sorry. hasn't. But I re I sent him an email and resent the link. So if, okay. that's, if that's why he's not here, hopefully that'll work. Okay, Adam. Approve. Thank you, Ranji. No, Abstain. he hasn't. But I re I Abstain. And Nolan. Abstain. Very good. And we should have enough here to approve the minutes from the August 5th meeting. Huh. All right. So that's taken care of, Jessica. Um, back over to you to pull out some um, member collective public feedback. I think that's where we are. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, so yeah, this is an opportunity now for folks to kind of come on camera and mic and share any feedback you have from your communities, anything that's important or concerns from either your um, the community that you represent on the task force or the state agency you work for. Um, so just go ahead and raise your hands and we'll get a cue going if you have some feedback that you'd like to share with us before we move forward with the meeting. It looks like Mike Tabor just joined. Welcome. Yeah, Paula. Um, the feedback that I've received um, from folks that have been actively participating in the different options for psychedel psychedelic um, uh, experiences in the community is that there's a, a need for more integration support. Um, and that while people um, are using their support people or their therapists, there's a real, I guess, a sense of 
you know, more support groups or places where people can go that don't aren't necessarily connected to therapists to get support for integration. That's all. Thanks, Paula. Mm -hmm. Do others have any feedback from their communities or agencies? Yeah, Donovan. Buju, Donovan from Red Lake Nation and Ojibwe Tribal Outreach. Uh, my month consists of reaching out to spiritual elders and talking to uh, people about spirit plant medicine and thinking about what does that mean for our community. And last month I reported on meeting out, uh, reaching out to them, to the practitioners within Indian country and mental health therapist areas. This month was more focused around the aspect and what does it mean for us as indigenous people and how can we help and work towards the future of healing in that sense? Um, a collective kind of um, understanding is the re-remembering and doing a, the educational output is uh, another area that came back in this um, information gathering. So I think as we think about what does this mean going forward, I think really helping people understand what it is and what we can possibly do with integration and with medicine use. I think it's going to be very uh, beneficial and valuable for us to continue our mission driving forward to uh, educate people. So that's what I have. Miigwech. Thank you so much, Donovan. All right, we have Renji and then Paula. Thank you, Donovan. Um, so feedback I have um, received has been on on two fronts. One has been from uh, patients who have spontaneously uh, provided um, feedback on uh, on this work, uh, as well as colleagues that are both in the mental health field and then non-mental health field. And I will describe all three sort of um, uh, groups. So patients are exceedingly excited about the possibility of using psilocybin and other potential medicines, including what we had suggested, MDMA, maybe LSD, um, in, uh, in settings. Patients have said in that they are open to it in the way that we provide um, in our services in ketamine, we're providing supportive services. And what and, and that's how they have used these medicines in non-ordinary states. Uh, and what they have appreciated is the care that they've received at the front end, support during the actual experience, and then the integration, as Paula had mentioned a little bit earlier. Um, they are concerned about using or having people access these medicines without some sort of supervision. That's patients, uh, the majority of the uh, of patients. And there are others who have said, you know, adult regulated use is, is not, uh, it can be, um, it, it shouldn't be too concerning, but adult regulated use. Physicians are a little bit different. Um, and I'll speak about the non-psychiatric, uh, non-mental health workers first. Uh, and we're talking about neurologists here. We're talking about people in you know physical medicine rehabilitation folks that I reached out within uh, Hennepin County, uh, which of course, as you know, is a um, safety net hospital that treats people that are underserved, that are suffering, that are struggling with treatment resistant PTSD. Uh, and these physicians are potentially excited about the use of adding something that we don't have access to. However, they've raised the concerns about who's going to watch them, who's going to screen them, who's going to take care of them, who's going to make sure that something, there's some sort of a safety for these folks if they go forward with these, you know, uh, either trials or uh, clinical access. And now I'm going to switch to the mental health folks. And these are folks that work in the inpatient psychiatric facilities, so our inpatient units, and then also people that work in the psychiatric emergency rooms and also outpatient psychiatrists that have seen. Their concerns have all been, absolutely, we should probably have some sort of an opportunity to try these, you know, these, uh, these potential medicines. But 
seen people come into the ER with really bad hallucinations from um, from psychedelics. Not something that is probably going to last forever, but it is not only a scary experience for the individual, but it can create future anxiety for those people that have tried it that one time and have had you know terrible trips or challenging trips. They want to know how are you going to how are we going to figure out a way to prepare people for something like this? And those are the folks that are working in the emergency rooms that are actually seeing that. They're also concerned about the potential concerns about uh, triggering the or, or a dormant schizophrenia or a psychotic disorder that might occur in folks that are predisposed to that. And so that was their concern. It's not a hard stop, but it's just a how do you sort of screen for something like that? The folks in the inpatient units were they they're they shared similar concerns from the ER psych, uh, psychiatry emergency room folks as well, which is psychosis, psychosis, bipolar disorder, uh, and how do you screen for that, and who's going to take care of them if something like that should happen. Um, but in general, the majority of these physicians and providers were optimistic about potentially adding this to a um, as a tool for folks if it's regulated by the state. Thank you, Renji. That's very helpful feedback. Paula? Um, I would just say that there seems to be also kind of echoing some of the stuff that Ranji shared, a uh, need for community education actually now, not, not later, because people are starting to participate in pretty significant numbers. So I'm, I'm interested in working with anybody that wants to launch some kind of a public education uh, activity now, um, whether it's a conference, but really a 101. And if you're planning on using psychoactive substances or psychedelic substances, these are considerations that you should be aware of. Just really a lot of kind of informed consent, um, particularly for folks that are choosing to use because it's they're using. I mean, they're choosing, they're using, they're choosing to participate now. Um, and so I think we need to do some public education sooner than later. Thanks, Paula. Yeah, I agree with that. <laughs> Um, all right. Any, anyone else that wants to provide feedback from their community perspective or state agency perspective or personal perspective? Could I just ask Mike, 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 if you wanted to share any more from your email, you sent out such an eloquent email. I just wanted to just acknowledge that. Okay. Um, you hear me all right? You can hear you. Okay. Um, I actually, um, you know, I, I reached out to a lot of um, veterans who um, I, I actually found more, had more luck with first responders and um, ran into a group of firefighters um somewhere out on the west coast who were engaged basically in what I would assume our adult regulated use model would look like where they're basically sharing um, sort of gifting natural mushrooms um, between each other and um, I mean first they're, they're already first responders, so much, much of them had um, the training um, and whatnot. Um, the kind of safeguard that I've heard is basically having, um, I know there's more complicated uh, drugs that will, uh, they can kind of uh, uh, interdict if you're having a bad trip or whatever, but basically like Small dose of Xanax usually um, would be some kind of the uh, last resort. Somebody just can't calm down, but they haven't had any issues with that. And I mean, because, uh, you know, firefighters, obviously they deal with a lot of daily trauma. So I guess it, as it as their career goes on, they it really adds up. It starts to wear on them and they've. Um, at least at, the, at th this group um, was able to basically, um, you know, 
kind of enact what we've been talking about with this uh, adult regulated use model to, to great success. Um, and they, you know, basically asked me, go ahead and, uh, you know, we give our endorsement for you to let them know how it's been working for us. Uh, the veterans that I've engaged with are either having, haven't tried it yet and desperately want to, um, like, but there's just, I mean, even they want to start out with ketamine or whatever, but they're, um, a lot of these guys are, are dealing with so much trauma and so much, um, I guess PTSD that they've tried every, you know, all the, uh, kind of holistic approaches and this is kind of seems like the last resort for a lot of them this doesn't work they're you know feeling very uh you know i guess the MD mdma decision was a huge disappointment and a lot of them had been engaged with their medical providers as hang on a little longer kind of thing because this is coming down the pipe, and then when that happened, there's there there was quite a bit of uh, almost despair for a lot of people um, that were, you know, had tried everything, um, and so uh, you know, even if we get up, you know, get a clinical model up and running. Um, it really makes no difference. These guys can't afford two, three thousand dollars a sitting or whatever. So my suggestion early on was some sort of peer engagement. Um, so those that have had experience could kind of either be the sitters and watch it, or um, you know, possibly bring in one certified. Um, I know we don't have the Simon certifications, but, you know, the, the, the ketamine um, counselors that have, um, you know, I'm thinking of one in particular who's just done this hundreds of times. And what they're trying to organize is like a group, maybe five to ten guys or at, at the most. Um, I just had this one person kind of. So that they could all chip in and basically try to get some services without going broke. Um, you know, when when these guys are or before they're in crisis, they've already got many many stressors going on, and then to add financial stressors on top of that, they're just not they're not willing or able to to engage in like this kind of clinical model. Um, and even right now, the ketamine, I mean, it's not super expensive, but they're still, it's out, of, it's out of reach for a lot of these guys. And then considering the fact that you, you know, the best outcomes you would probably have multiple medicine sessions really adds up really fast. So, you know, one of the things that my group has kind of, discussed is um removing all those financial barriers is the is the key thing and there's just out of all our recommendations there's just no way to do it other than the adult use um the regulated and so basically we, we talked about to, to wrap this up we've talked about you know the dangers and we think there's guardrails you could put on so you don't so you know so you can avoid diversion um, when you're dealing with veterans, you're not, there's no, you know, your youngest veteran is going to be 24 years old and that's young, young. So you're not worried about diversion to like teenagers or whatnot. And, um, you know, so I guess we want what's best for all Minnesotans, but there's also this aspect of first responders and veterans that are just a kind of a unique situation they're better suited for the for the actual therapy and they're um you know 
I think we should, you know, as they go to write this legislation, I think if there's a way we, to put in some type of um, exceptions, waivers, of you know, cost waivers, you know, stuff like that, to help, just to help get these guys the access they need, as particularly some of these guys that are just um, really headed in that downward spiral um, and try to uh, interdict it as soon as possible and so it, before it gets to the crisis level. So that's basically kind of, you know, when I wrote this letter, I think um, for those that are planning to abstain, I guess it's not a requirement um, to put your reasons why, but I think if you want to just send them to me, a short paragraph, I, I really want to understand the argument against it because just for future advocacy and, and whatnot and, and, and the kind of issues that we're looking at. Um, if, uh, I mean, these guys, they, they need, they need this treatment. Um, and, uh, you know, whatever we can do and whatever we can get written into any kind of, you know, future legislation, um, I think we have to look at it as like it's an it's it's a crisis level, um, particularly when you think the suicide rates for normal civilians are already high, and the trajectory is going upward, you know, and it's fast. And then you think veterans are committing suicide at the rate two and a half times that rate. Um, you know, we just saw. I mean kind of COVID and the response to COVID kind of lifted the veil. We just saw our government move heaven and earth and just basically suspend the Constitution and force experimental, you know, I'm not going to get into that, but we saw that if something's a crisis, the willingness to push things through. Um, and so I guess the question is, you know, like how many how many, no, you know, what's a comfortable number for everybody? I mean, they say 22 suicides a day, and it's like, first of all, it's way higher than that, but are we working on, you know, reducing these numbers, or, I mean, is that, are people good with that number? It's, uh, you hey, know. Mike. So, just wrapping up. Okay, um, thank you. That's it. Thanks, yeah, Michael. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate you bringing up all those those thoughts and important issues related to veterans. Um, just want to keep things moving along. Thank you so much for sharing your perspective and your passion for this. Um, St Stefan, you're next, and then Renji. Thank you. So, uh, just to caveat off what Mike was saying, as a veteran, um, I can lay in on my personal experiences through this process and this journey, and also within the conversations I've had within the community. I think the biggest fear across the board is it becoming almost too accessible and these molecules losing their value and their ability to help, much like we've seen with cannabis. Um, once it becomes openly and widely acceptable or accepted and used, you know, it then becomes recreational and the work can't be done. Um, and there's an immense amount of work required once consuming these compounds to kind of get to a place of comfort. It's not just you consume it and then the next day everything's fantastic and your life has changed. Uh, it just allows you the ability to see the different perspectives um, to then make the decisions to kind of clean the world up a little bit and become comfortable with the world around you. Um, and if we don't enforce or have some sort of educational piece behind all this very, very quickly, we're not gonna be able to get our hands around it. And it's, it's going to be just proliferated across the country in a very, very, very rapid way. Um, that's all I got. Thank you, Stefan. Important word of caution. I appreciate that. Renji? Thanks to both Michael and St uh, Stefan for, for making that comment. First, we need to be very... Um, just cautious about what these things can do, like Stefan said. 
We really do. I mean, we have heard the the benefits blasted out on media about the potential benefits of psychedelics, and there are. But this is not a magic bullet. It's not something that is going to, as Stefan just eloquently said, it's not going to change your life. What changes your life are the decisions that you make from the introspection and the perspectives that you gain from these potential molecules. And that's not guaranteed. So we need, as Paula had said, education, education, informed consent, safety, a responsibility to educate people that this is just a potential tool. There are, and we need to have safeguards. Number two, as uh, Michael had said, it's costly. It's going to cost a lot. And we, sh we as a, a state have to figure out a way to make it uh, accessible to folks. We have to. In our clinic, what we have, we, we've gone to the insurance companies to try and get it covered. We can get ketamine covered for, our, uh, for people that have insurance. We've gone to the city of Minneapolis and we've had firefighters that the city of Minneapolis is paying for. We have to get the state to cover these sort of expenses because it is costly. And so I, I just want to keep that in mind that one, we have to be responsible with the, the, the recommendations that we make to, to number one, keep people safe, but to also remember that we as a state can fund some of these things so that people can ex responsibly and uh, access this safely. I'll leave it there. Thank you. All right, before we move on, is there any other feedback that folks want to share at this time? Uh, Jessica, this is Stacy. If I may, I want to go back to Michael. And just since you're here now, I've got you marked as present, but you weren't you weren't in place when I was doing the uh, uh, minutes approval from the August meeting. May I have your uh, vote to approve, abstain, reject those minutes? Yeah, I was absent, so I'll abstain. Abstain. Okay, thank you. All right, back to you, Jessica. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I think now I don't see them in mural, but I know there were slides sent out if we want to do kind of our high level overview of where we are just to bring everyone up to speed. Um, Jessica's so got, she's got them built in. So um, best work with, sorry, with our Jess to make sure we walk through things. Yeah, great. Jess, can you keep up that first? Um, I am, yep, I'm looking for them here. Here we go. Oh, no, I'm missing a decision flow chart. And while she's doing that, members, what she's doing is just going to different parts within this mural. So it's all in the mural, up in various meetings. So she's just going back to um, uh, different areas to queue things up. So as soon as she gets that first one set on the... Um, oh, sorry, I thought outline. I was already sharing. <laughs> yep, there you go. Thank you. All right. So not expecting everyone to, to look at this. And I think this is probably from last month's meeting in terms of where it's at on mural. You were also sent these in a PDF um, and they're posted on the task force website. But this is kind of a really high level snapshot that Nick Core put together of like our timeline of the work that we've been doing. So um, if you can go to the next slide, please, Jess, just sort of zooming in on where we're at right now. That one, yeah. Um, so we're here in September, so we've already kind of honed in on what our recommendations might be and have come up with six, re six recommendations that we're gonna vote on today. And then now we start, um, you know, kind of once we have official recommendations, um, if we end up having any after today, then we're going to really start doing most of the work on writing the report. Um, and so that's gonna be a pretty heavy lift from several of us on the task force that have volunteered to do a lot of the writing. Um, obviously, Caroline Johnson's done a lot of the meat of the report for um, the scientific review of the literature and the comparative effectiveness with other um, therapies, community research, indigenous research, things like that. So that's all already in the report and the rest of it is around kind of the recommendations that we might come up with and any um, policies or regulations that we might suggest would be good to implement any of these recommendations and whether the legislature wants to pick that up in the report that we submit to them on January 1st, um, which is when that is due. Next slide, please. 
So just, you know, I went over this in pretty high detail. Um, and so, you know, you can refer back to our August um, recording, um, which is up on YouTube, um, as well as the slides, but I'm just going to give another high level overview because I know a lot of people were out in August. Um, so just briefly what we sort of learned at our different meetings each month um, throughout the course of our work from subject matter experts, our kind of first big learning meeting in December was just getting people up to speed around how clinical trials work, how the Food and Drug Administration approves new drugs like MDMA, LSD, and psilocybin, which are all kind of making their way through this, this approval process through clinical trials, and some special considerations that have had to be created by the FDA uh, to, to manage and, and assess effectiveness and efficacy, um, which is comparing drugs, uh, you know, how, how well it works compared to a kind of innocuous placebo um, and sort of what kind of extra things need to be put in place in order for that to be a reliable outcome that people can, can scientifically justify based on the way that the study was designed and knowing that there are some substantial hurdles in this area, given the unique nature of how psychedelic drugs work and that they can't be blinded, um, which is usually the standard in trying to determine whether it works better than another drug. Um, so all of these issues are kind of baked into this process and the government's really trying to do its work to figure out how to handle all these things coming through these, these drug development pipelines and clinical trials prior to being approved and available as medicines. In January, we started learning a lot more about the law because heavy, heavy amounts of duties in, our, in the statutes for the task force is really trying to figure out what are kind of the legal realities that we're dealing with and what are some of the regulatory things that need to be changed, um, both in statute and well as policy. Um, so we first heard from Robert Rush and Ishmael Ali, um, who are two lawyers in this space in January, um, teaching us about the history of drug prohibition, how the Controlled Substance Acts came to be, and how kind of these new programs that are de being developed in Oregon and Colorado with psychedelic medicines like psilocybin um, are really kind of taking this kind of approach that's kind of experimental and referring to it as states that la as labs because everyone's kind of doing different things when it comes to drug policy and it's all fundamentally federally illegal unless done through existing federal channels. Um, so it's kind of this weird experimental space with drug policy and access to these things. Um, in February, we learned from um, another lawyer, Mason Marks, who has a lot of deep knowledge about the Constitution and federal laws um, and gave us a little bit more insight. He was involved with um, the program in Oregon coming up and being developed and implemented um, and also talking about what's going on in Colorado and how what they're doing could potentially run afoul of federal laws regarding data privacy and blending um, psilocybin services and healthcare services with schedule one drugs into federally supported healthcare systems, which could pose a problem. Um, he also noted that decriminalization is the simplest option to implement both legally and financially and funding more clinical trials and education um, is also legal under federal law. So those are things that we could just currently do already. And we've also heard ad nauseum how much education is needed in this space and that's completely legal to do. Um, Next in March, we learned more about sort of indigenous issues around psychedelic medicines. Um, there is a long history of psychedelic use um, and plant medicine use in indigenous cultures worldwide for thousands of years, um, with more recent kind of efforts from the, the West kind of suppressing that. And there's been a long history of cultural genocide, particularly in this country, um, with um, the government really trying to squash the um, plant medicine practices with peyote of, of the Native American tribes in this country, um, and now trying to kind of restore that and, and setting some laws in place that protect that access to those medicines for, for Native Americans, specifically around peyote. Um, and then also, also ethical guidelines for businesses with psychedelics and lessons learned from the cannabis space from Ariel Clark, who's a lawyer. Um, and then the issues around cultural genocide were um, talked about by um, Christine DC McCleave, um, who also runs this Colorado working group um, for uh, federally recognized tribes. And so, um, so those are good, two good points of contact regarding um, indigenous issues in the psychedelic medicine space. Next slide, please. All right. And then in April, we heard from another lawyer, Shane Pennington. Um, so he's a lawyer that's been actively doing litigation uh, with the DEA under right to try laws. Um, he's also been pushing this new idea that if states are going to be doing these medical slash research pilot programs with psychedelic medicines, that there are exist there is an existing research statute in place that was um, formed in the early 1970s around the time the control Substances Act was initiated that um, basically was a way to allow for methadone clinics to kind of keep running when they were still trying to figure out where it would be on the Controlled Substances Act. And so there's this special sort of 
um, research arm of the federal government that you can petition the U.S. Attorney General for that might be kind of a more safe access option for medical slash research programs that aren't really experimenting with drug policy and doing it in a federally illegal way, but can actually create a state federal partnership to implement some of these things. That could take a while, but it is something that he recommends as more of like a looking towards the long term solutions around just changing the national narrative around drug policy with things like psilocybin. Um, and whether they could change their the, the scheduling of psilocybin based on more real world data coming out that's collected in a very intentional, legal and safe way. Um, in May, we learned from um, we had a whole panel of people. We had Mason Marks come back and then we had some other people kind of working in the space. Jason Ortiz from the Last Prisoner Project and then Emma Knighton from the Oregon um, programs, as well as Dominique Mendiola, who runs the Natural Medicine Health um, program um, in or in Colorado that's been trying to get their service centers up and running. And then really talking about, you know, if we're thinking about how to create an access program in Minnesota that is equitable, not too cost prohibitive and safe, and trying to figure out what that looks like and kind of honing around this topic of regulating for equity and making sure everybody has, has access and that they can access it in a way that's culturally competent. And so there's a variety of things that popped up around how to actually implement that. Um, and some kind of harsh lessons learned from how things are going in Oregon with their psilocybin service centers. They've been up and running for a little over a year, I think. They got started in August of 2023, and they've they've seen over 3,000 people come to their service centers, but they're insanely expensive. It's mostly a tourist industry at this point. Um, you know, sessions running upwards of three to five thousand dollars. It's really cost prohibitive, and a lot of that is because of all this heavy regulation and service fees and licensing fees and having limitations of where um, people can do psilocybin or have psilocybin services um, done. You know, there was issues around accessibility for people with disabilities and not being able to travel to service centers. So I think there's a group suing the Oregon Health Authority um, for access so people can do it in their own homes um, that aren't able to travel. So there's just little things like that that we're learning from, color from Oregon. Colorado hasn't started yet. They're just going to be rolling out their service centers in 2025. So we don't know what that's going to look like, but they're already sort of seeing the costs um, build up. Um, and so it'll just be interesting to wait and see what happens in those two states. Um, next in June, we learned from um, folks from Lycos Therapeutic about the development of MDMA-assisted therapy for PTSD. Um, we had them come talk to our task force the day before. There was a large advisory panel that met to um, give the FDA their recommendation on whether MDMA would be approved, and they voted against it. And then ultimately, at the um, beginning of August, after our last task force meeting, um, the FDA did officially sort of reject MDMA-assisted therapy at this time. It wasn't a sort of like, this isn't a non-starter, don't submit again, but more they re they requested that an additional clinical trial be run with additional safety data so they can assess things better. Um, so that's kind of a wait and see, but it definitely was a big kind of blow um, to the community, um, people living with PTSD that were really kind of hoping that this was going to be approved this month and it's not. And so it's a longer kind of wait and see. <laughs> uh, next slide, please. Okay, so that's kind of like where we are now and just sort of through our working group meetings and different discussions in the task force, we have kind of honed in on, on our six recommendations that we're going to be voting on. But first we need to kind of bring this up to speed about, well, first I wanna stop right here because I kind of did a big deep dive into where we're at. And I do wanna get give folks an opportunity to ask questions of kind of where we're at before we move on to this discussion around um, whether abstaining votes count towards our total when we actually vote. So does anybody want to talk about or have questions um, about any of the things that we've learned up until this point before we move on to doing some logistical voting? Yeah, Adam? Yeah, um, I want to make sure, not necessarily today, but at some point in the near future, that we do have a conversation about public education and outreach. Uh, you know, Paula mentioned that's important. Stefan mentioned it's important. Um, it's just really important. And I, I don't want to lose sight of that as we s solely focus on the written recommendations to the legislature. Yeah, I think that's a really good point, Adam. Um, I know I noticed yesterday, and I don't know when this happened, the website for the task force was updated, you know, with more information. So um, I think that could be a home for a lot of the information. And, and just thinking, you know, collectively with the working groups, we could probably come up with some additional information to stick on there. Um, and then I'm just not sure in terms of resources, like whether MDH would send out educational pamphlets or what that would look like, you know, 
prior to the end of the task force's work. Um, I'm, I'm open to ideas of how to disseminate educational content other than the website. And Adam, this is Stacy. just pointing members to the last meeting results from the mural. If you follow me by just hovering over my photo down in the bottom center of the screen, I've zoomed in to where all of that input is from, um, from your last meeting. So that might refresh memories for what was what was produced at the last time. So we've been doing some work on it. It's not it's not a done thing, but we've been doing some work on it. So if that just refreshes memories, that's great. Yeah, this is really helpful. And all of this has been sort of put into the report as things to talk about. And I think we're also thinking of like, how can we get some of this information out quicker? Who's going to do that? It's not trivial to put together public publicly accessible educational material around complex topics like this. So um, it would be kind of a, a heavy lift. So just trying to figure out who's willing <laughs> to put this educational material together in addition to myself. And we can get that out. Any other thoughts about kind of the update and where we're at right now before we move on? Senator Corrin, do you have any questions given that this is your first meeting? We, sh we should probably officially welcome him too. Oh so yeah, let's, yeah. yeah, so let's take sure a moment. Already. Yeah, Senator Corrin, welcome to the task force. You just joined, I think, over the weekend. So I don't know if you want to go on camera and <laughs> kind of introduce yourself and where you're thinking with this work. Senator? Looks like he's on mute. Let's see if we can double back at a later time and see if we can catch him. Okay, Jessica. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, should we should we move on to talking about the abstaining question? Let's do that and then let's take a break. How does that sound? Yes. Okay. So, okay. so here's this issue. I'm just going to tee it up real quick for some context, and then maybe I'll turn it over to you, Stacey, for some logistics. Um, but before we move towards voting, I want to clarify that the legislation does not mandate that we vote for recommendations, and therefore members have the option to abstain from voting. Members who abstain are therefore also not required to provide a justification for abstaining if they do not want to or are unable to at this time. No judgment either way. Voting for our proposed recommendations today is an opportunity to understand what our group consensus is about the access options and whether we want to officially recommend them in our final report to the legislature. It should also be noted that the legislature is not bound by any recommendations or lack of recommendations that may arise from our task force report. Rep Smith, please correct me if I'm wrong on this. Um, but this report and our recommendations will be a resource for future legislation that aims to allow and regulate access to psychedelic medicines in some way at some point in the future, whether that be in the 2025 legislative session or future sessions as the drug approval landscape and public perception of psychedelic medicines continues to evolve. So I just kind of wanted to set the stage of that and we kind of just need to decide um, as a task force what um, abstentions mean in our voting process, given that, um, because we have decided as a group that a supermajority or two thirds of the votes is required to pass any recommendations. Um, for folks that want to abstain, the question is whether those abstentions will count towards the total in calculating a supermajority or not, or be considered as sort of like a non-participation in voting and thus not a vote. So we wanted to decide with a simple majority first, whether we're gonna count the abstentions. Um, and then move on to actually voting. So Stacy, do you want us to take a break before we kind of open that up or should we have some discussion around this first? Yeah, a couple of things. One, Jessica's gonna field, our Jess is gonna field this, the, any more questions on this voting to abstain or not to abstain. <coughs> I got my fingers on tracking the results. So let's turn it over to Jess uh, to make sure people are clear on what we need to do here before we can actually do any voting on recommendations. Once we've done this vote, then we'll take a break and then we'll come back and vote on actual recommendations. So let's turn it over to Jess. Thanks. Um, so I think Jessica laid it out pretty, uh, pretty fully. Um, 
the, basically the question is, do you abstain the total pool of votes for a recommendation? By, like, by definition, a, of an abstention is not voting. So you're not you're not voting yes. You're not voting no. You're just not voting. So I think that's kind of the the, the question right here. And the actual question you're going to vote on is on mural votes to abstain do not count in the pool of existing votes toward the supermajority needed to pass a recommendation. Um, I know like this issue trip has tripped up a lot of people in the like last few weeks, like on the planning team and everything. So I, I just, I want to make sure people understand what we're voting on. So if you have any questions, uh, now's the time to ask before we vote on this. And okay. Guthrie's hands up. Guthrie, go ahead. Well, uh, good morning, everybody. I, um, why, so we're, we're bringing this up now. Is there a concern that there's going to be a lot of folks abstaining from the vote? I don't know if it's a concern, but we have heard, I mean, like we introduced the option to abstain because there are folks who did not feel comfortable or their constituents, you know, their agency, their, the folks they represent, whatever, did not feel comfortable necessarily voting yes or no. So abstaining gives them an opportunity to not vote, to, to not vote basically. Um. So for me, if the state agencies aren't going to vote, the state agency reps aren't going to vote, are they members of the task force? Or are they here specifically as content experts from the state? They are members of the task force. They were, you know, assigned to represent their agencies. The age, you know, this is in the legislation. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that yes, they are considered members of the task force. And is it a concern of the agencies that the representatives representing their agencies should not vote on this? That I cannot answer as I am not uh, one of these. I'm not a member of the task force representing a state agency. I do see I, Helen has her hand up. Uh, I, would, I know Adam had yeah. his up first, but since Helen is. Uh, I would certainly we'll like to hear Helen. from the state agencies uh, about the reluctance to vote on this. If, if we go could. Ahead, yeah, go ahead, Helen. Adam did have his hand up first. So Adam, would you? I, I, sure, I'll, I'll just go really quick. I just we, want to yield we, to him. So. Yeah. Uh, we did discuss this issue at one of our working groups. And there is an answer from Robert's Rules of Order, which is that abstentions are not votes. They are neither a yes note, yes vote, nor a no vote. They are a not vote. So strictly speaking, under Robert's Rules of Order, if, if members who are to abstain from voting and vote neither yes nor no, then it would ultimately come down to, of the people who voted yes or no, was it a simple majority? Was it a super majority? Was it something else? So that's pretty clear from Robert's rules, exactly what the process would be. You know, the bottom line is if we were to follow Robert's rules specifically, then, or strictly, then abstentions wouldn't, would be immaterial with regard to two thirds. Of course, we are not necessarily bound to do exactly what Robert's rules specifies as an entity we can create our own system that's totally fine but i just wanted to update people that we, we did look into this there was a clear answer uh with robert's rules what robert's rule says generally we've been following robert's rules for the entirety of this task force but again we are free to do something else if we choose thanks adam go ahead helen well, thank you. Um, what what I would uh, say is that um, I did uh, 
it seemed more to this point. That's why I waited. But I did actually check with our agency, of course, and uh, talk with the, one of our assistant uh, commissioners, as well as the director uh, of my unit department. And, um, and of course, we have feedback, of course, from our commissioner. So I'm um, having said that the one thing that, uh, well, there may be a couple things as we move along through the vote. But uh, the first thing that we want to make sure that we share is that um, our agency would oppose uh, any uh, move to um, remove abstentions as a denominator. So how that fits into Robert's rules, um, I will leave to, uh, you know, Adam, if you want to speak to that specifically. However, if the abstentions are a part of the denominator, then that suggests some input into the question. Go ahead, yeah. Adam. Yeah, thank you, Helen. I really appreciate that. I just want to clarify. So um, the, if I understand your question is, if abstentions count toward the denominator, that would mean an abstention is essentially a no vote. But if abstentions don't count toward the denominator, then an abstention just is not a vote at all. Is that where you're at with your thinking. Are you speaking to me? Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Um, I will say that um, I think that perhaps there may be uh, people with more legal background than I on this question, because I think it kind of uh, maybe gets a little sticky wicked. But um, the, the fact of the Roberts rules and voting, and I don't know that I've seen it actually speak to the denominator, but, um, but of course, if we take it as part of the totality of the vote, these many voted yes, these many voted no, these many abstentions, then if that's the total number of votes that are taken, and then you look to see from that number or from that count, which ones uh, ended up being um, no votes, which ones ended up being yes votes. And then I think you have the answer. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Got three. Oh, was, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Jessica. Oh, I'm just calling on the queue. It was Guthrie and then Rob Smith. So if everyone's following, I hope you can see my concern here. If all seven government agency representatives vote abstain on this, then we have to have 100% consensus in order to reach supermajority per the mural outline. Um, my concern in all of this is this is just now being brought up where we've spent the last 11 months talking about moving forward with the process and we're just now sort of finding out that the states don't want to uh, want to abstain from the process. Um, I feel that uh, if the state agencies are making an effort to abstain, um, that would have been good to know on the front end of the process uh, before voting on a supermajority or before kind of conducting business for 11 months. Um, I feel that's really tough uh, for our facilitators and especially our chairperson um, to run through this process, uh, get to the end, and then hear that the state doesn't want uh, its delegates to weigh in. Um, and a, and a non-weigh-in, in effect, means that we have to have 100% uh, presence and 100% um, support for it in order to get a supermajority. So from, from my standpoint, um, I find this uh, very frustrating. Uh, I also find it uh, a little um, murky and, and not as transparent as we want to be as we're all here in good faith with one another. Thanks, Guthrie. All right, we have Rep. Smith, Helen, and then Paula. So uh, maybe just to uh, clarify for Guthrie some some reasons why I think we're going where we're going. I'm speaking just for myself, not for any particular department. First, I think we are moving so that votes to abstain do not count in the pool of existing votes toward a supermajority. And I think that's what Helen was trying to defend because the departments don't want to have any perceived. Um, some departments may want to have any perceived way one or the other. And I actually think that's not a bad thing. Um, as the person who wrote this bill, I will just say, uh, generally, you know, the division of powers, the executive branch, the departments within there, they execute the laws that are written in the legislature and signed into law by the governor. And so um, their place is not to uh, put a thumb on the scale 
in those particular discussions of actual legislations of laws, and especially with this report potentially going through many different legislators and many different even administrations of executive power and different commissioners, I think they're actually responsibly saying that um, we don't want to be perceived to be for something when uh, you know legislation could come out differently in different ways, um, depending on elections and all those sort of things. Um, so I, I think it's actually quite healthy for uh, the departments to be on this task force, give their input, answer questions, give their expertise, while not wanting to be perceived of pushing one policy over another when there's so much work to do at the legislature um, and discussions there. So that's my understanding, um, uh, having worked with departments on legislation in the past. I do think it would be helpful to say that those uh, abstentions are complete abstentions, meaning it's not towards the supermajority vote, just so we, you know, people who are voting yes or no get the, you know, weight that they should have. Um, but that's, I hope that's helpful in sort of describing why some of the departments might not want to, you know, be on the record of a yes or no on a particular policy or not. Especially, like I said, a lot of these policies are very broad and we'll need to have a lot of work in the legislature and as we've already talked about in the public um, before they are accepted. Thank you, Rep. Smith. All right, Helen and then Paula. Well, thank you. And uh, thank you so much, Representative Smith. Uh, you did a, a wonderful job with kind of bringing a little bit more clarity to, to my comments. And I would say that you were kind of spot on. I also uh, re raised my hand because I want to make sure that uh, when I spoke and when, and when I speak, I'm only speaking for commerce. The other state agencies are certainly, um, I don't want that to be a blanket. I'm just saying this is where commerce is at. So thank you. Thank you, Helen. Paula? Um, just to be clear, so if the state agencies abstain, do we have the numbers to uh, achieve a super majority, which Guthrie seems to say that that's a problem? And if that is a problem, can we make a vote instead to just go with a simple majority? Um, so I, I don't, I don't, I need to know the numbers about if they abstain, do we have what we need? Can the remaining voters come to a super majority? Why wouldn't they, right? Yeah, Paula, so that's a good point. So we're we're talking right now about voting for whether the abstentions count towards the total. So that would change the denominator. So if abstentions count, then the total we need for a supermajority is, you know, the denominator there is 22 versus if we decide that abstentions don't count, then whatever that denominator is, is just yes plus yes plus no. Yes versus yes plus no. So that total. And then the abstentions are kind of not votes. And so that'll depend on how many of us are here voting right now. Plus we have a few emails votes coming in. Um, so that just depends. So we're just trying to decide right now, do the abstentions count towards calculating our supermajority or not? And then Correct. we'll vote. But, but we could still come up with the supermajority if we just chose, if we chose to have the abstentions not count as a vote. There's no reason that we couldn't have a supermajority. It's just a matter of taking the numbers that of people that voted. Correct. Right. Yes. Okay. So we would still use a supermajority, but it would either be of the yes, no votes only or yes, no and abstain. Right. No, and that abstentions really sort of take away from a yes vote, right? Because it's 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 a not vote, but it adds to the denominator. So you need more yes votes to get to a supermajority. Right. But, but if they're not in the denominator, we can still get a supermajority with those that vote. If the abstinence, absten our, our, our quorum is 12. Okay. So I think as long as 12 people vote and then whatever the majority is of that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Anything else to add, Jess? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I just I just want to make we don't know how anyone's voting except the AG's office because we got Bennett's votes uh, a couple days ago. So there's we don't know how people are voting. Uh, you know, the abstention was added as an option. We don't know if or how many you know folks are gonna are gonna use it. We don't know how many yes votes or no votes we're gonna get. So like this is all still you know. It's all still very theoretical until we start voting and, you know, until we decide how we're going to count votes. We don't know who is voting which way, again, except for the AG's office because Bennett sent those votes to us last week. Everything else is to be determined shortly. Thanks, Jess. All right, Guthrie. Can I make a motion to not include abstentions in the uh, denom denominator of the vote? Yes, I'll so we get that motion. I'll second that. Okay. Okay. We have a motion to, to move on voting on this. Should we do that now or after the break? Let's. This is Stacy. Let's go ahead and get this vote done 
And so that when we come back from break, we're good to go because right now it's fresh in everybody's mind, if that's okay. And so what I heard is that Guthrie's moved or made the motion, uh, just as it is on the green um, sticky on the mural, votes to abstain do not count in the pool of existing votes toward a supermajority needed to the pass a recommendation. And did I, was it Adam that said he seconded? I wasn't going to. Yep. Oh, Adam. Yep. Okay. So Stacey, where are we putting our votes? Is this a vote by roll call? Yep, it is. So if we are all set, I'll run through the list and we'll see where we stand. And um, I'm just recording the information and our mad partner, Nick, is counting things up. So let's just see where Stacey, we stand. Stacey, can you clarify yes and a no vote, what they mean for this? So a yes vote, let's see if I can get this right. A yes vote is that abstains do not count in the pool of existing. So the number of overall votes is going to shrink if you vote yes, if there are abstentions. And I wanna just make sure people are like nodding or like I screwed that up and Jessica's nodding. So I've got that right, Nick's nodding. Everybody's good, okay. May I go ahead and, and run the run the vote, Jessica? Yep. Okay. Courtney. Yes. Uh, Helen. I want the abstentions to count. So that's a. So you want the abstentions to count. So you want to keep the vote. Okay. So you're voting no. Right. Okay. Guthrie. Yes. Paula? Yes. Jeremy? No. Stefan? Yes. Margaret? Yes. Uh, let's see, David's gone, Bennett's gone. Uh, Bennett uh, voted ahead of time, no, by the way. Uh, Senate, Mar uh, 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 Mark, sorry. No. Nick? No. Ari? Yes. Jessica? Yes. Kit? Yes. Jill? No. Ken? No. Donovan? Yes. Andy? Yes. Michael? Yes. Adam? Yes. Ranji? Yes. Nolan? Yes. All right. It appears to me that the yeses have it. I don't have a final count yet, but I think we're pretty safe with that assumption. I don't know, Nick, if you're counting faster than I am. I counted 16, but I was counting on my fingers. So. <laughs> okay, so the yes no, is wait, passed. 14. 14? Okay. I counted 14 as well. Very good. So the yeses have it, meaning the abstentions do not count in the pool, which lowers the amount depending on where a member might be abstaining. So if it's, for example, the first recommendation and we have three people abstaining from it, we have to drop the total number of votes down by that amount and then figure out what the supermajority is of that total. Am I getting that right? And is that resonating with everybody? I think that makes sense. Um, do we want to go ahead and take a break and then come back? Yeah, but Adam, you came off. Um, sure, you, yeah. Did you want to say something? This I, is I important. Just, I really want to make sure everybody's got this head squared in their heads. Go ahead, Adam. The way I'm thinking about it is the only votes that count are yes votes and no votes in favor of one of the particular 
motions and the abstentions just do not count as votes. That's exactly. the way I'm looking at this. And within that reduced number, we still need to look for a supermajority in order for a recommendation to pass. Okay. Yes. Okie doke. Um, Jessica, it's time for a break. Uh, I'm looking over at our timeline here. When do you want people to come back? Do you have a strong sense of that? Well, we can do our standard 10 minute break. So come back at 11. So maybe 11.02 or 11 on the dot. 11.02 it is. 11.02 everyone, back at 11.02. Thank Thanks. you. Stacey, before we vote, I want to address the justification thing that Michael mentioned around. You're muted. <laughs> that was me violently agreeing with yeah, that. I, I, thank you. I'm glad you caught that. That's important. Yeah. Good. No, I was I was going to talk about it at some point, but this is the perfect time. So before yep. we when we come back, yep. I'll I'll address it. Yep. Sound of my voice. We have two minutes we'll, before we'll begin, so you might want to make your way back to your um, your computers. And Jessica, I don't know if you heard what Jess was just saying. I heard. I was walking down the hallway and heard them talking <laughs> about the content. Jess, I'm go gonna. Ahead. I'm just gonna address because uh, Michael mentioned it uh, with the abstentions. Um, the there's been some. Uh, a misunderstanding that folks are going to be have going to have to justify that, and I just want to talk about talk yeah. about that and how we're going to address it in the report. Yeah, I mean, I tried to make a comment that like the justifications aren't required. Like, if somebody doesn't want to submit one and they are abstaining, there, there's no there's nothing binding anybody to vote or or submit that. So I'm, I'm not forcing Correct. it at the chair. Mm -hmm. No. Yeah, and it might it might just be that the selection of the terminology kind of makes people. Ooh. Yeah, initially when we yeah. had those kind of decision trees of like trying to hone in what our recommendations would be, I had this like, do you want to abstain? Yes or no. If you're abstaining, yes or no. Would you be willing to provide a recommendation? It's completely right. optional. Yeah, would yeah. be nice, would be helpful yeah. for the report, but it's not mandatory. Yeah. Oh, and then justification language came from when we were using the gradients of agreement. Put your justification down here, that sort of thing. Or so. Yeah. Okay. All right, everyone. Want to make sure folks are back uh, at it. So if you're a member, I'm looking at the participant list. Can you just use your reaction thing and let, give me a thumbs up or some sort of sign so I know you're all here. Uh, reactions are down at the center of your screen, bottom center. You see a little heart with reactions. Give me something. Thank you for, for folks that are starting to give me thumbs up. I just want to know that all the members are here before we get started. So give me a sign, people. Looking for a thumbs up. Something hand clapping works too. I think that shows up where you're in the participant list. Jill, I see you. Ken, Donovan, thank you. I think I saw a few others. Um, little celebration things works too. Yay. All right. Jessica, what do you think? Shall we go ahead and begin? Yep. I think that sounds good. Okay. Very good. Can I jump so in? So Jessica... Please? Oh, yep. Go ahead. Uh, before Jessica starts walking us through each of the recommendations members, Jess is going to just talk a little bit about some, some confusion aside from what we were just dealing with in the whole abstention thing. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to Jess for that. Uh, and then we'll go ahead and get started on the recommendations. Jess. Just, just very quickly. Uh, I know uh, Michael mentioned it when he was talking um, and I've heard from some other folks uh, there's some confusion about if you do abstain, you have to justify your justify why you're abstaining. That's not that's not what we're we don't we're not doing that today. We're not doing that ever. We would in the report like to include uh, just a, a, a statement, an explanation. If 
if you're willing to, if your agency is willing to, if, you know, if whoever is doing the abstaining, uh, just to kind of get a fuller picture for the report, you know, for the legislature when they're doing, you know, when they're taking this up down the road, um, just to kind of get an understanding of why, what might need to change. You know, if something changed about this recommendation, would you feel better voting for it? You know, or what, you know, what concerns you have, um, because that, and, and we haven't figured out how we're going to address it in the report. We might create a template for you. We might just give you some questions um, that you can answer. We'll get that figured out soon because we have to. Um, but the, it, it just helps create a better picture of, you know, what could, what could be changed or improved or, you know, whatever about the recommendations to make, make them more palatable for a broader population. Go ahead, Jessica. Yeah. Thanks, Jess. I just, I just want to point out that it's, it's not mandatory. I think this is like a, a, a request, but that I don't think we can require anybody to submit that. It would be nice for context for the report, but no one is under any obligation uh, to do that, especially if your agency doesn't want you to, or you don't feel comfortable. That's totally fine. Um, it's just a simple request that, that would just help us make the report sound a little bit better versus just there's all these abstentions and and that's it versus having some kind of context. So just wanted to say that a little bit more. <laughs> Thanks. Adam, did you have your hand up or I thought I saw you come off mic? No. No, I, I just turned my camera back on. I had to step away for a second. Got it. Okay. All right, Jessica, you ready to go into the um, first recommendation? And yep. Uh, yep. There we go. It's on the screen for you members that are on your murals. <coughs> Excuse me. You're looking for that big area number two. Uh, you can see how we've got it um, structured. Nick will be doing a final count uh, in those little yellow boxes to the right of where the recommendations are. You can see my cursor moving around. Um, and uh, yeah, and I think that's it. I'll be calling the roll. Uh, so we've got all, all our duties assigned here, but let's have it teed off by with Jessica. Go ahead, Jessica. Yeah. Thanks, Stacy. All mm -hmm. right, so we will be doing a voting via roll call today. There are six recommendations, so please be ready to unmute and cast your vote to help us move through everyone efficiently. Depending on when absent members vote, we may not know whether a recommendation passed by a supermajority or not at this meeting. Jess will report to the task force when all member votes have been recorded if that happens. There also may be additional recommendations that come up in the report writing process. If that happens, the task force will have an opportunity to vote on them as well. All right, so moving on to the final vote for these broad recommendations. So the first broad recommendation will have two votes under it. So this is for removing criminal penalties for possession of personal use quantities of psychedelic medicines and for non-commercial without enumeration, cultivation and sharing of psilocybin containing mushrooms. So the first thing we will be voting on with a yes or for, against or abstain uh, via roll call is the task force recommends the Minnesota legislature remove criminal penalties for the possession of personally used quantities of mushrooms containing psilocybin, synthetic psilocybin, MDMA, and LSD. All right. So it's a yes, no, abstain vote. I'm going to go through the list. First names. Courtney, you just keep popping up at the top of the list. So let's, let's, uh, let's begin. Courtney. Yes. Helen. No. Guthrie. Yes. Paula. Yes. Jeremy. No. Stefan. No. Margaret. Yes. Uh, Bennett was a no. Um, David is not here. Uh, uh, Mark. No. Nick. No. Ari. Jessica. Yes. Kit. Oh, yes. Thank you, Kit. Jill. No. Ken. 
No. Donovan? Yes. Andy? Yes. Michael? Yes. Adam? Yes. Ranji? Yes. Nolan? Yes. All right, we've concluded those. We'll give them a moment for um, Nick to enter the information in. So let's just hold tight there. And he'll also be calculating out, since we've got no abstentions on this one, it will be based on the total number, which is 22. With one vote. Oh, 12, that's yeah. right. With 12 yeses and nine noes. 12 that's yeses, correct. nine noes. And I'm also reminded that we have one member that's not here today that didn't submit his votes uh, ahead of time. That's David. I think that's the only one. Correct. OK. All right. Do we move on to the next one, or do we want to discuss this? Right, really? I, my preference, uh, although I'm not a committee member, oh, we've got a couple hands up. Let's just check in with a couple hands up. And then um, depending on what they bring up, if we can move along, that's great. All right, Stefan and then Guthrie. Just want to provide some insight on, on my response. Like I'm all for access to naturally producible compounds and molecules. It's fantastic. Um, when we're looking at MDMA and, and LSD, my perspective is that we're then asking for bathtub labs to be stood up to manufacture these products, which that could be extremely dangerous. So I will continue and hold on to that now. Thank you for your perspective, Stefan. Guthrie? Um, yeah, I appreciate that. I think that would change votes for people potentially. Um, for my question here, with the board recommendations, are we doing super majority on this as well? Or was that just for the final overall? My understanding is it's, oh. Yeah, you were right like this is where the super majority counts. Yeah. So yeah. if there were Thank abstained, you. it didn't sound like anybody abstained here. So then. Good right. enough. Thank you. Well, of course, plus, nine, plus one, whatever the hanging vote is from David is. But it, that's exactly right. Yeah, we just don't know without David's vote. Okay. All right. Jessica, all right. are you ready to go to the second one? Yeah. All right. So this one, also under this broad recommendation one umbrella, the task force recommends the Minnesota legislature remove criminal penalties for the non-commercial without remuneration, cultivation, and sharing of psilocybin containing mushrooms. See this up for and a and here we go. Yes, no, abstain. Courtney. Yes. Helen. No. Guthrie. Yes. Paula. Yes. Jeremy. No. Stefan. Yes. Margaret. Yes. Bennett is a no. David is absent. Uh, that brings us down to Mark. No. Nick? Uh, no. Ari? Yes. Jessica? Yes. Kit? Yes. Jill? No. Ken? No. Donovan? Yes. Andy? Yes. Michael? Sorry, yes. There we go. Adam? Yes. Ranji? Yes. And Nolan? No. All right, give a moment for Nick to tabulate and enter the information in while he's doing that. Uh, if you're on the mural, you can move your attention over to rec recommendation area number three, or recommendation number three. Can you tell us how um, Bennett voted? 
Oh, I'm, I thought I did, but let me let me find him again. Hang on a second, Jill. I think that was Jill. It was oh. a no. Yeah, it was a no. Stacy, I have a question. Was that Ranji? Yeah. Go ahead, yeah, Ranji. Go ahead. I, um, is it possible to change my vote? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, in light of what uh, Stefan had said about uh, um, bathtub labs and MDMA, I, I'm going to change my yes to a no vote on the first recommendation. On the first recommendation. So it would be against 10, 4, 11. Mm -hmm. And let's just give a moment for Nick to get caught up on that one too. Are you good, Nick? I'm good. Okay. So you can see on All right. question two that it's 1348 against. Yep. And Nick, if you can click away from the first um, record, just click. There you go. Okay. Back to you, Jessica, to tee up recommendation number three. Excellent. Okay. So again, two kind of recommendations under this broad recommendation, two regarding creating a state regulated clinical program of psychedelic medicines in Minnesota. So the first one to vote on is the task force recommends the Minnesota legislature create a state regulated program for the clinical administration of synthetic MDMA, LSD, and psilocybin. All right. And Courtney. Yes. Helen. No. Guthrie? Yes. Paula? Yes. Jeremy? Abstain. Stefan? Yes. Margaret? Yes. Then it is a no. David? Ah. Sorry, everyone. Uh, Mark. Abstain. Nick. Uh, no. Ari. Yes. Jessica. Yes. Kit. Yes. Jill. No. Ken? No. Donovan? Yes. Andy? Yes. Michael? Yes. Adam? Yes. Ranji? Yes. Nolan? Yes. All right, that's done. Let's give Nick a minute to get caught up on that. Stacy. Mm -hmm. This is Mark. So yeah, um, I'm Mark. Time to clarity um, with more clarity. Um, yeah, yeah. On number on, on number three, um, mm -hmm. I will be a no. Yeah, and no. I, my apologies, Stacy. This is Jeremy. I'm a no on number three too. Okay. So just to clarify, there are no abstentions for number three. That is that is correct. No abstentions for number three. And my apologies, the recommendation is for a clinical program, correct? A state regulated clinical program? Mm -hmm. Correct. Mm -hmm. And Nick, tell us when you're ready. So I count 14, four and seven against. Okay. All right, Jessica, you wanna queue up number four? Yeah, was that including Bennett's vote too? Yes, uh, and a reminder, Bennett voted uh, no. Okay. All right, so um, for- mm -hmm. All right, so for recommendation four, the task force recommends the Minnesota legislature create a state regulated program for the clinical administration of psilocybin containing mushrooms. Here we go. Courtney. Yes. Helen. 
Abstain. Guthrie? Yes. Paula? Yes. Jeremy? Abstain. Stefan? Yes. Margaret? Yes. Bennett voted yes. David is absent. Mark? Yes. Nick? Uh, no. Ari? Yes. Jessica? Yes. Kit? Yes. Jill? No. Ken? No. Donovan? Yes. Andy? Yes. Michael? Yes. Adam? Yes. Ranji? Yes. And Nolan? Yes. All right. Time again for Nick to do his count and enter the information in. And Nick, just so I'm checking, yeah, I see two abstentions. Yep. 16, right. four three against and two abstain. Very good. Thank you. Jessica, back to you for number five. Great. Get that queued up on the screen. All right, so broad recommendation three. There's just the one under here. Uh, the task force recommends the Minnesota legislature appropriate funding for clinical research regarding the health benefits and treatment of medical conditions through the administration of psilocybin, MDMA, and LSD. All right. And here we go. Courtney. Yes. Helen. Abstain. Guthrie. Yes. Paula? Yes. Jeremy? Abstain. Stefan? Yes. Margaret? Yes. Bennett is a yes. David is absent. Mark? Yes. Nick? Abstain. Ari? Yes. Jessica? Yes. Kit? Yes. Jill? Abstain. Ken? Abstain. Donovan? Yes. Andy? Yes. Michael? Yes. Adam? Yes. Ranji? Yes. And Nolan? Yes. Very good. And a moment for our Nick to... Uh... Hey, Stacey. Yeah, uh huh? Uh, I think... Hang on here. Yeah, I think you might have been going from the old email for Bennett's vote. Uh, he was a no on number four. I thought I had double checked those. Okay. So he's a no for number four. If Ka Kari, can you confirm that? Do you have the email open? Yeah, I did. He was a yes for number five. He's a yes for five. What is he for four? Can we look at the slide? Who's the yeah? Um, so number four, the task force recommends the Minnesota legislature create a state regulated program for clinical administration of psilocybin containing mushrooms. His vote is no. His vote is no. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Do we have the yes before? We yeah. had a yes before, so we have to change we have to change that one for recommendation for. My apologies. I thought I had double checked that. Is this all going into like a, a spreadsheet or something that we'll have like yep. a 
Yep, that's what's that's why I'm not looking at anybody other than my spreadsheet right now. And we'll have to update it once I get Dave's votes. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't know, don't know when that will happen. Sounds good. I'll keep it trying. And Ranji, just just a just to double check now that I'm I'm totally nervous. Uh, recommendation number five for you. Your vote was what? Can we switch the slide? I think it's yes, but I want to make uh, confirmation. Which slide do you want to see? Recommendation uh, slide. Five. Whoops, there we go. Nope, that's six. There you go. Yes, my answer is yes. Thank you, Ranji. All right. So number five, we have 16 for zero against five abstentions. Cool. All right, we'll move on to the last one for today. Okay. Recommendation six. Okay, for this one, just one thing to vote on. The task force recommends the Minnesota legislature allow and regulate adult use of psilocybin containing mushrooms. Okay, here we go, Courtney. Yes. Helen? Stain. Guthrie? Yes. Paula? Yes. Jeremy? No. Stefan? No. Margaret? Yes. Bennett is a no. David is absent. Mark? No. Nick? Uh, no. Ari? Yes. Jessica? Yes. Kit? Yes. Jill? No. Ken? No. Donovan? Yes. Andy? Yes. Michael? Yes. Adam? Yes. Ranji? Yes. And Nolan? No. All right. Thank you, everyone. Uh, just cross-checking with Nick, I see just one abstention. So will we just send out what the final uh, decisions were at once we hear back from David, and then we'll send out those yep, results. Yeah, we'll do that. We need to factor in abstentions and lowering the number and hitting the supermajority and all that stuff. So we'll just want to just cross-check all over the place. Yeah, good. And Kit? yeah, thanks everyone for the vote. That was as smooth as could be. Looking at the broad recommendations, one, um, and after <clears throat> hearing the concerns there, is there a possibility to amend, to separate uh, MDMA, LSD, and synthetic from psilocybin uh, and reboot. Well, I think that was the purpose of the second de uh, removing criminal penalties was specifically for mushrooms. Yeah, Thank but you. it's also adding like the ability to like share them in addition to removing the criminal penalties around possession. Thanks for the clarification. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Kit? Number two, food possession then, because it doesn't say anything about possessing personal quantities of psilocybin containing mushrooms. Yeah, that's a good point that it's not specifically stated in that one. Does, would that change anyone's vote? I think we were just- Hold on a second. If we could, could you say that again? I was having a hard time hearing you. I just want to make sure everybody's hearing what you were saying. Sorry, well, Jessica. Recommendation number two, does that include possessing personal amounts of psilocybin containing mushrooms? Because if we say no for recommendation one, you can't possess it, but you can grow them. Right. Yeah, I think it's implied, but I think it's not explicitly stated in that one. 
What do folks think? Does that change your vote? <laughs> Stefan and then Marinji. And then Donovan. Stefan, did uh, you have my, Yeah, my, my understanding was the first one. I guess I misread it. I thought it was specific to synthetic, right? Um, that, that's how it was originally. It was like, do we want to decriminalize the possession of just the substances? And then there was an additional thing around the fact that you can actually just grow and source psilocybin mushrooms, yeah. which is I'm all for growing, growing and sourcing uh, raw, real mushrooms. Uh, synthetically derived is a whole nother ballgame. So yeah. I'll stick forth where I'm at. Yeah. So that would just, the first one would just be like uh, removing criminal penalties just for possessing, not for making. Right? It's just if you have it on your person. You wouldn't yeah, get a track and still still gonna stick with him. Yeah. Renji and then Donovan. Yeah. It, it may this may go on for the uh, to the next round, but uh are, have we defined what a the, the quantity of a, a personal use is or how much uh someone could have on their on their person? Yeah, so this is something that the working groups are trying to figure out. It it's nuanced depending on the community, the substance, all that stuff. It's not a simple answer. So it's something that the working groups need to kind of figure out. And Ari has a lot of good kind of literature and resources in that vein. Donovan? Yes. Um, my question just comes back to what Ranji mentioned. And, um, and I, I'm kind of, I'm for most recommendations, except, well, all of them, except probably this one is if it's, the the psilocybin or synthetic um product i'm definitely not for the synthetic product um and I'm, my voice is always for the natural plant medicine um and then the the quantity and amount is just something that isn't really understood here so i guess that's just my input yeah, I appreciate that, Donovan. Um, so the idea for these recommendations was to just get a general broad sense of what we want to pursue. And then through the working group and report writing, we're going to put in some of the details of how any of these things might be regulated, what are the parameters, and then that's an additional opportunity for the whole task force to weigh in on anything that might you know, be a go or no go kind of thing within each of these recommendations. I don't know if that helps. There's still a lot of work to do. We're just trying to figure out what do we actually want to focus on. Um, Senator Corn, and then Rep Smith. Uh, Hi, Jessica. Yeah, it's, it's similar comments. So in, in number one, um, I'm all for the natural uh, mushrooms, right? That's it. Any, we shouldn't be promoting anything synthetic, uh, MDA, MDMA or LSD at this time. Um, I think that we have to get our feet under this program um, and just leave it with the natural mushrooms. Then I could be persuaded to vote the other way. Got it. Thank you for that context, Rep. Uh, Senator Corn, uh, Rep. West. And then Adam? Yeah, I guess just as some additional comment, because I was a yes and on one and a no on two. Um, I don't share as many concerns about the synthetic stuff. Um, my And the personal use to, I would also say, is the quantity of that is up to the legislature more than anything, because they would be passing the bill. So that would be determined way down the line. And shouldn't, we can just say personal use, the legislature determines what that is. Um, but for number two, the reason I voted against that one was because it essentially just allows a black market to operate without any protections whatsoever. And that is a big mistake. I think we did in cannabis legalization is allow the transfer and cultivation and grow before we had regulated sales. And um, I think most people know I am supportive of cannabis legalization, but not legalization without any functioning. So I feel like if you allow cultivation and sharing now you basically make it impossible to go after maybe a bad actor who is putting things in there that shouldn't be in there because it's a non-regulated market. Um, but if we could get to agreement on number one, I think that's a good place to pass because we don't want to hurt consumers. Consumers are just consumers. Uh, it's the dealers and that kind of thing, which is not as a big a deal in this space as it is in other spaces, but it's still very important. So I think going forward, if we reduced, if we narrowed task force one's recommendation there uh, i think you we could get many people to yes it sounds like so that'd be something to look at thanks yeah thanks for the feedback rep west um adam and then ari thank you uh given the comments from senator corin and representative west now uh i think it might be worthwhile for this task force to explore removing criminal 
criminal penalties for possession of personal use of naturally grown mushrooms containing psilocybin, which would be kind of uh, the number one that we voted on without synthetic psilocybin, without MDMA, and without LSD. Uh, we didn't really vote on that. You know, we voted on two, which is specific to cultivation and sharing. Um, but given the comments from people, I think there might be a super majority for removing criminal penalties for possession and personal use of natural grown natural grown mushrooms containing psilocybin. So I'll just put out there perhaps something to explore either not this here, this meeting or later. Just an observation. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. Ari. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Representative West, for your comment. I just wanted to ask you, or maybe Jess, if you could clarify, did you then vote yes for a broad recommendation? number six around adult regulated use. Uh, no, I voted no on that. I think uh, going, which is actually a little different. It's like, I think what we've seen with cannabis nationwide has been a more gradual approach with the med medical markets opening around the country. I think our medical market was pretty awful. I wasn't involved in crafting that bill, but Having only two operators is pretty insane. Uh, so I would rather have us go the approach that we've taken to cannabis, which is a medical market, before we even consider otherwise. Um, because really, from a public safety standpoint, this doesn't have nearly the criminal element that other substances have. It's still there. But this is such a higher potential for helping uh, people in clinical settings. And that's that's, I think, what you see agreement on. Basically, everyone here, I think, is very excited about the opportunity to help people there. I think the re that final recommendation, is it's just way too early to recommend that. Um, I was pro-cannabis legalization, but I was glad we weren't one of the first, because I think there's a lot we can learn from other states before we take the plunge here, uh, especially on an issue that might, I don't know how the broader public really cares, but uh, I think moving slow before moving quickly is why I voted no on number six, but yes on number one and the medical programs. Thank you, Rep West. Ari, did you have any follow-up with that or is that good? Okay, all right. So we have Jeremy and then Mike had his hand up and you took it down. Um, we'll start with Jeremy and then Mike. Yeah, thanks. I, I just want to maybe offer some context. I mean, I think, um, you know, there's a lot of, um, uh, you know, important research going on in this space right now. And I appreciate the comments of the fellow task force members. I think, you know, this is um, something that the legislature still can explore. These are just recommendations. Um, and so I think, um, you know, from, you know, from my perspective, I think just hearing what we heard from Ranji earlier about some concerns from the medical community, hearing some concerns about public safety, you know, I think it was preliminary to um, to vote on a recommendation to move this forward right now. But I think these these conversations can still continue. Um, and so just really appreciate the work of the task force that really, I think, identified some of the key issues that we're going to need to look at both in state statute and the issue in the um, uh, you know, seeing what happens with the federal government, with the ongoing research, and is there a way that we can move in step with the federal government uh, just to mitigate the, any potential risk? Um, and then just also appreciate the comments by Representative West um, about kind of an incremental approach in terms of starting with um, a medical market and, um, and then seeing where we go from there. So um, just appreciate everyone's work on this. Yeah, thank you so much, Jeremy. Um... Mike, did you want to chime in? I saw you had your hand up and then put it down. I just want to give you the opportunity to share if you still want to. I guess I just have a, are we considering taking these back or rewriting them and then voting again? Is that a, for, for some of these or um, I guess my question is um, would we be able to um, put some sort of amendment on some of these where First responders, veterans, and native, I don't want to speak for um, our native members, but like exemptions for certain members of the population, or is this, is that foreseeable, or is that just, is it, is it straight across the board? 
Yeah, um, I think we need to kind of have all that kind of bear out in the report writing as we try to figure out what would any implementation of these look like regarding um, these two first recommendations. I don't know if Jess, that's why you have your hand up around whether we need to clarify the language and revote um, or what were you thinking? That, that is what I was going to what I was going to talk about. Um, like theoretically, that that change in number one would basically just be removing natural mushrooms and making that a separate recommendation. So it would basically be number one and number two, or we'd have number one, the task force recommends the Minnesota legislature remove criminal penalty, penalties for the possession of personal use quantities of mushrooms containing psilocybin, period. Then, then we would have another, we could have another recommendation that says the same thing. It's, and then we just remove mushrooms containing psilocybin and leave the synthetics alone. We could theoretically do that today. We could go back to the work group on Thursday and discuss it a little more and vote on it again in October. Um, just depends on what we have time for and what folks have, if folks think they could vote on that today, separating those two out into separate recommendations. Well, I worry because like we've had these questions submitted in the state agency <coughs> yep. to kind of review them. So I don't yeah, know if I want can... to anyone today. We can definitely do it in October then. And, you know, and, and again, like you said, you know, we might come up with some of these, um, uh, you know, clarifications or additions uh, in the work groups and the report writing. Um, and if they're, you know, if they're significant, we will bring them back to the full task force to, to vote again. Yeah. So Renji. this is Stacy and Renji. I see your hand up, but if I could interrupt the flow for just a moment. Um, Jess, if you scroll out in this area and look to where Nix has his voting, I've put some white boxes to the right side of where those voting tallies are. There have been so many interesting, thoughtful questions that have come out. This is a place where you can all post some of the ideas that you've had, maybe clarify them a little bit, slide them into the box. I mean, of course, we'll review the the comments that came verbally, but I think this is another way that people can just put their thoughts down. And that way, when it comes to shaping the work of the work groups meeting on Thursday, shaping the agenda for your next month's meeting, we've got all of it captured in these spaces. So I would simply encourage you to make a sticky, put your comments in, slide it into those white boxes that relate to the, the actual recommendation you were voting on. And I, I hope that's clear enough. And thank you, Raji. I'll turn it over to you for your comment. Appreciate that, Stacey. Um, mm -hmm. I just wanted to, uh, I agree that we should revote on uh, uh, rule number one uh, with uh, finer language and we don't have to do it today. We can do it in next October. So I support that. Yeah, thanks. And I just want to speak to the kind of general process of report writing and then we're going to move on to kind of the logistics of report writing um after this um but just know that like this report you know is going to be a really good resource for future legislation and the idea is that potentially you know things will fold out in increments as kind of the public perception changes around this obviously the federal landscape is continually evolving um and it's just sort of this interesting landscape and we don't know where we're going to be in a year and so hopefully all of this research will go into this report and it can be leveraged in the future um, as sort of new things become adopted and new legislation is introduced that may or may not pick up any of these things. So it's an evolving process. I know it took a very long time for cannabis to get legalized and have programs. So it was very it's kind of stepwise process. Um, so I envision this being the same. And so we're really just creating this really comprehensive resource for future bills from my perspective. I don't know if anyone has a different perspective on that, but that's kind of how I've been seeing a lot of the work that we've been doing. Um, so I don't know if we want to discuss this anymore or if we want to take another short break and come back and talk about the report writing. What are folks feeling? How about a thumbs up for those of you that have more to say? If you have more to say and you're not ready to go on to a break, just give us a, a thumbs up or some sort of uh, reaction sign in the uh Sorry, um, I don't have more to say, but I just I think if we can just move. I'd like just to keep moving if possible. So we got a vote for keeping moving and skipping over the break, keep moving. Anybody object to that? 
Like, you, you know, need to go to the bathroom, go to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just if you really need to go to the bathroom, go to the bathroom. All right, I'm not seeing anybody right. objecting to just continuing on. So we'll uh, we'll take a lead from Jeremy on that one. And uh, Jessica, that I think means that Caroline's up to talk about the report development. Yes. Uh, first, I want to apologize about having my camera off. It's been kicking me out of meetings when I have it on. Um, so I'm just going to move ahead without it today. Um, so I don't have any slides. Um, so we'll just go to this mural activity that Jess has focused in on. This is just a walkthrough of the outline that was sent with the meeting materials. Um, we want to review it because there are a few sections that still need writers. Um, but the first thing kind of to keep at the forefront of all of our minds is the timeline. Um, Jess has put together a draft schedule and that's here in red by the number three. Um, and this is what she will be holding you to if you are um, participating in writing. Um, so the kind of the plan in the big timeline is to have the entire report finished by early November. We've had a request from MDH um, to see if it's possible to be finished by the end of October. Um, there's a number of eyes that just need to look it over for kind of clarity and formatting. Um, so if that's possible, that would be fantastic. Um, but with that, I'll walk us through the table. Um, this overview will kind of apply to both the body um, and the appendices. So we have each of the sections in this first column, the lead author in the next one, and then anyone else interested in helping to write in the third column. That final column is for anyone interested in the first review of a section. Um, and I say the first review because I imagine everyone uh, will want to review the report on their own before it's submitted. So these bolded sections are where we still need help. And the boxes that are green are ones that probably don't need additional help. And so as we're discussing writing, if you're interested in a section, please feel free to add your name to a sticky um, and move it into the appropriate box even if there's already a name there. Um, and then as a reminder, you know, this is your task force. And so all of your voices are the ones um, shaping the output. So I'll go through each section really briefly. Um, and maybe we can pause at the sections that need authors to see if anyone wants to volunteer to help. Um, but also feel free to stop me if there's any questions along the way. So we start with um, the executive summary. It's just a very high level overview of the entire report. Um, there is some space for helping if you're interested. Um, then we have the glossary of terms and acronyms. I can work on this as an ad administrative task, um, but if someone feels like that's what they would really like to do, please feel free to put your name there even though it's green. Um, next is, um, oh, I guess things got moved around. So I'm going to skip and go to the legislative charge, um, which is just a copy and paste of, you know, our guiding legislation and then the introduction. So it'll be in a, that order. Um, so this is kind of the space um, to set up in the report, kind of any background or any relevant information that we feel is necessary. Um, and we do still need writers for this. Um, so I'm going to pause here for a second open up the floor and see if anybody would like to help write this. All right, see we have Kit as an additional member. Um, and again, you can kind of think of this as writing teams as well. So if you maybe aren't comfortable being the lead author, um, a couple of you can group up to be a lead author or the additional members. Um, so if there's any other interest, uh, we would definitely encourage you to put your names there. Um, but seeing no more interest, we'll move on, but do think about if you want to participate in this. Um, so the next section after our legislative charge is the, the high level scientific review. Um, so this is, this is that high level summary of all the reviews I sent you over the course of the summer. Um, and then the community research is also a section that was sent out previously. Um, this includes the population statistics of um, psychedelic uh, medicine use and a, a brief account of historical and indigenous use. And then we really get into the meat of the report, which is the recommendations. Um, most of this is filled out, which is great. I see that Renji's put his name to help with recommendation two. Um, we need 
perhaps a lead author for kind of the overarching recommendation three, uh, but there is there is help in that as well. So if anybody is interested in taking that on, um, Paula, I see your hand. I guess I'm just wondering if if most of these recommendations don't pass, maybe we shouldn't be even talking about assigning writers. Until we yeah, so I, I have a section that we can get to in the appendix. So since this is kind of up in the air right now, we don't know what's passed, what's not. Right. Um, there is the option that the task force can decide if you want to put any recommendations that weren't approved, you know, maybe you put those in the appendix. And then if the authors who were going to write that still want to write it to have the information there, it can be in the appendix. If something you've signed up for doesn't make it in the report, if you want to help with another recommendation, that is an option. Um, if you want to not write anymore, that is an option as well. So this one's kind of in a holding pattern, but this might be like a tentative, I will help if this passes um, with, with the expectation it might not or the understanding it might not. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I'm just wondering if this is something that, you know, we have a work group coming right around the corner. We'll have a pretty good sense because we did get most of the votes except on the potential revised first recommendation we'll know which ones go and which ones don't. And we can mm -hmm. kind of re regroup around about the demand for, for writing because we- Yeah, we absolutely. Like one, one or two recommendations. Mm -hmm. So we can kind of put this as tentative until the work group kind of gets to talk about it and think about it. Um, so next we have a section for tribal sovereignty or the tribal impact, um, whatever you would like to call it or something else entirely. I see Donovan has put his name down for that. There was some discussion to make sure Donovan and Guthrie's voices were heard. Um, so thank you for putting your names there. Um, Jessica has also signed up to help. And um, right now you'll see a name you don't recognize. Brandon is from the Minnesota Indian American Council. Um, he's a lawyer that Jessica has reached out to and he's happy to um, review this section for us. Um, and then finally, we have the public education piece, um, which looks like has been filled in entirely as well. Are there any last questions on this section? Okay, hearing none, um, we can move over to the appendices. Um, so I'll go through each one of these kind of briefly as well. But I do want to point out that these are all optional. Um, any of them can be removed if the task force wants. This was just kind of based on the Alzheimer's report. Um, so let's see. First, we have um, task force membership. And this is just a table of the task force members. Um, so that's already there. It's kind of been copy pasted. Um, the next one to think about is that we want to make sure we thank the subject matter experts that have helped us. So a bulleted list is already in that section in the report. Um, so this probably just requires someone double checking that everyone we spoke with is included and then um, providing you know, appreciation for that. Next is our report development process. Right now, the guiding principles from the charter are filled in and we've included the meeting schedule, um, which, which was included in our first report. So that was pretty administrative, we filled that in. Um, but this is probably an important section um, for the task force to maybe describe how your decisions were made and kind of the processes that you took to get to where you are. Um, after that, we have a section um, for any personal anecdotes. I know I mentioned this last month, but if anyone is interested in providing their personal perspective or anecdotes from your community, um, that could be an option. And so I would say if anybody is interested in, in that, um, so that we don't add anything to Jess or Jessica's plates, if you have a, a paragraph or a couple um, to me, maybe by late September, at the very latest, I can put those in the report for you. Um, and so then this next section is where we could have, if the task force wanted, um, you know, including recommendations that weren't approved just for clarity. And I think this, um, we don't have to discuss it right now, maybe maybe when I'm finished with this, but this could be a two-part discussion in that, do you as a group even want to include those in this section? Um, and then, you know, if those authors would want to then continue writing them, 
that might be a work group discussion. Um, moving on, here's a space for abstentions. It was brought up for the option to anyone to provide their short commentary around their vote. It's not necessary. Um, and including this section, I think, is also up to the task force as well. So we can talk about that in a minute. Um, next, we have in here a space for the definitions of the legal pathways that might be viable for any recommendation that's put in the report, um, kind of as a form of glossary. Again, if the task force thinks that's helpful. And then for the next appendix, uh, I moved some of the details from the literature review here just to keep it kind of high level in the report. Um, following that is the methods of the literature search that were voted on by the task force. Um, and then Jessica had suggested including some population statistics for both alcohol and cannabis as a comparison. Um, this section is in progress, but again, if, if the task force doesn't think it's necessary, it doesn't have to be included. Um, and then finally, references. Um, since I already have a list of references from the scientific portions, um, and this task can be fairly administrative, I'm happy to curate this section. Um, and I would ask that those of you writing any portions that may require citations uh, to keep your own running list, preferably in APA format, um, and send those to me when you're finished and I can go ahead and integrate them. Um, do we have any questions about the appendices before we move on to kind of discussing everything? Okay, no questions. So this final activity is over here on the right. Um, and this is also where we can all kind of talk about it. Um, so this is an area for anyone to address sections that are listed that you don't feel like need to be there. Um, and conversely, sections that aren't there that maybe you think should be. Um, and so while I give people a few minutes to think about it, um, I see there's already some discussion going on there, but we would encourage um, a verbal discussion to get everyone kind of on the same page. And again, you know, as another reminder, uh, this is this is your report. And so you as the task force as a whole get to decide um, what you want to include. Um, so I am going to pause. And if anybody who has put their stickies there wanted to talk about their thoughts, that would be fantastic. Um, hi. Yeah, I can come online. Those are both mine. The sec the acknowledgement of harms of, of criminalization is just a short one. I think that that should be added to the acknowledgement section that is ex existing. I think it's in line with the values that we laid out at the beginning. Um, and the second question is, where are we capturing the learnings from the subject matter experts? So where are we, like, are those going to be integrated into the recommendations? Like, for example, like we, a lot of our conversation has been around equity and making sure that these um, opportunities are available to people who might not have thousands of dollars. Would that then be integrated into the like recommendation around decrim or adult regulated use? Like how, yeah, how do we see those things coming in? This is your task force. And so I think this is what this discussion is right now. Where do you all think that should fit? Um, so I will keep the floor open for where everyone thinks that it most makes the most sense um, to include. Yeah, like I think has, point, Ari. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, it's okay. I mean, I'm just thinking like from a research perspective, from a qualitative research perspective, like I could see a very thorough process of like going through all the transcripts from the subject matter experts and coding them for different things, who talks about equity, who talks about whatever, you know, and then writing about those things and the wherever they go. But I also know that we have very limited capacity and probably not a whole bunch of time to do like hand coding of transcripts. So I'm wondering, like, from MAD, has there been any sort of categorization of the different SMEs? Any tagging? Like, this person talks about equity, this person talks about tribal sovereignty, something like that. And then we could like, sort of pull from those places into the report? I'll just say like, I've been keeping a tally of that. It's gonna be baked into the report development process as well as the awesome. 
organizations that use that. And I don't know that there's going to be a specific section of just like everything we learned from the SMEs. It's just sort of like making sure all of that is captured and where does it fit? And if it doesn't fit within any specific recommendation, just a general, like this is what we learned. It doesn't necessarily tie into anything, but it's important to know in terms of just equity and access and drug prohibition and things like that. You know. Awesome. Thank you. I'm open to other suggestions, but that's kind of how I was thinking of it, given that I'm going to be doing the bulk of the writing. Okay, great. I see that a number of a couple more have um, popped up in the sections. Do the authors of those stickies um, want to talk a little bit more about what their thoughts are? Um, I can. I wrote the one about public education. I just think that there's so much information that we all have and that it, at least in an appendix, a, appendix, there should be topics. We may not need to flesh out the whole content of a public education, but at least set the stage for what people need to do to educate the public and or providers that might be using these substances, like just some sort of broad here are the topics we need to cover, contraindications, um, benefits, pros, cons, and what you need to know. At least outline a template for that so that we, so that, no, I'm very few people will read the full report, right? <laughs> so um, what are the bite-sized tidbits that are um, practical and useful moving forward? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Just to kind of explain myself, I am happy to be one of the first reviewers to look at all of the sections, make sure they're like inherent, internally consistent with regard to different things like punctuation and phrasing and capitalization and all of that stuff, kind of give it an edit. I don't feel qualified to, to de be the main author for any of these, um, but I'm happy to give it a really close read to make sure that it's uh, that looks good, uh, ultimately, and that we represent our task force well. So thank you. Courtney, I see your hand. Yeah, I'm wondering if it, and I could make a note of this as well, that, um, that it would be wise to have another section discussing which we've talked many times about in, maybe it's in the working groups, having ongoing work. So creating a working group, whatever that might look like. And I think that, that it's really important that we put this um, in the report or the recommendation. And some of the things such as um, harm reduction might fall into that working group as well. And I just added something just like that, Courtney. I like while you were talking, it's I called it future considerations and looped in things like tracking the FDA trials, watching implementation in other in other states, and maybe like an ongoing work group could be another like future consideration for the legislature. Great, thank you. Those are all good um, additions. I think for um, people who have suggested extra sections, maybe do let us know where you think in the report that should fall, um, body or appendix, um, kind of where in each of those. And if you, as the person who suggested it, would be comfortable um, writing some of it, you don't have to necessarily be a lead. Maybe a couple of people could take this on together. Um, but we are, you know, there, there is a lot, it's a heavy lift. And so spreading it out is um, really helpful uh, to those who are writing. Can I jump in with a clarification? Yes, for sure. Uh, so we won't need anyone to, the, the task force isn't going to be um, reviewing for grammar, punctuation, one voice, anything like that. Caroline and I can do the one voicing Mads copy editor is going to review for accessibility, you know, punct you know, the, the real nitty gritty stuff. The, the task force needs to kind of look more broadly uh, in the review, you know, like if there are things that are incorrect in there, that's what we need, you know, that's what we need pointed out. The, you know, grammar, sentence structure, one voicing, that's, that's not the task force's job. 
Thanks for clarifying, Jess. I forgot to mention that. Okay, do we have any final questions, thoughts, concerns about the um, the writing process? Caroline, it looks like Courtney has her hand up. Is it still up or is it from last time? Oh, good question. Is that an old hand or a new hand, Courtney? <laughs> That's an old hand. <laughs> okay, perfect. Okay. I do see Guthrie but, has raised his hand yeah. though. Real quick, um, just given the vote, is our votes were the recommendations narrow, right? Like if we look at all of the broad recommendations that we made, um, kind of the end result is gonna end up being very narrow recommendations on a few of the broad areas. I think it would be good to highlight the areas that we discussed um, within the report <clears throat> and potential yeah, reasons idea. why we didn't uh, approve those. Yeah, that has been that has been talked about. Um, and so I guess that's a good thing to come to a decision on now. Do you want to include that um, for clarity or do you not think it's necessary as a task force? Uh, Margaret. This is an unrelated question, so I don't know if anyone wants to. Um, I don't know if we wanted to change topics. I'm just want some clarification on deadlines for draft one. I'm a deadline. Yes. Person. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so the first draft, if you are writing a section or participating in writing a section is due September 27th. Um, so Jess has that on the screen. Then it will be passed to the first reviewers, the people in the last column, and they, by October 8th, will have their revisions completed or, yeah, and then we'll have a second revision of that um, to kind of clarify any anything that the reviewers may have brought up by October 18th. Got it. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Paula, I see. Um, yeah, just a couple concerns. If we're not going to vote on the revised recommendation one until the first Monday in October, there's no way there's going to be, I mean, I, I would propose we just take a vote. Well, we have a huge turnout today. We're missing one person. You know, we can get, otherwise we're going to be running around trying to get people's votes that aren't at the October meeting to find out how we feel, how we're going to vote on recommendation when we have time. Um, I'm just, I'm just think that we're going to be stalled out. So just my two cents on that. And then also just to follow up on uh, Guthrie's question about, you know, I don't think we can as a, as a, as writers, identify why the, the, you know, we can make some assumptions or generalizations why the recommendations did, but did not pass, but unless the people that voted no actually tell us the reasons for voting no, we won't be able to represent that in the report. Yeah, I just wanted to chime in. Um, so for the, the removing criminal penalty section, I think we, the state agency specifically requested having like a month lead time to discuss this. So if we change what an official vote is, they need time to go back to their agencies to think of the different wording. Maybe someone from a state agency would have a different thought about that. But I think that was the agreement we had beforehand to give people enough time to officially vote or abstain. Um, and I think for the report writing, I mean, I think I have that section on removing criminal penalties. And, you know, to Guthrie's point, we're really trying to talk about the process. And regardless of whether these are actual endorsements and recommendations, there will be sections in the report around our discussions and research around this that might be useful in the future. Um, so I don't think we want to leave anything out of the report. It's just sort of what do we officially recommend? And what is the implementation of that will be borne out in the report writing. And I think everything else can be included as just, this was our process. This is what we talked about. Here's the research. If advisory committees wanna be formed around these things to continue the conversation, that could be a thing. So I don't necessarily think that's gonna hamper the report writing because the, the meat and the content and the information is there. It's just sort of what is the explicit wording of any official recommendations that would go into it. The research is the research and the information is the information and the decisions are kind of just what we're still kind of deciding on. Um, of like what the official recommendations will be. Um, so I just wanted to touch on that and I think it'll be fine. And if we want to move forward with this, we just we can just do it again in October. There might be other things that we might want to tee up to vote on. And so that can be one of them. It's just like, what is the explicit language? What exactly are we removing criminal penalties on? And is this an official recommendation? Um, Mike Tabor, I saw your hand up. Did you want to chime in? Yeah, kind of go off of what um, Paula just said. Um, 
you know, we're fairly aware. Of, some people had their minds made up months ago on some of these recommendations, and we've had numerous discussions and art and uh, um, kind of back and forth, and laid out a lot of information for people who didn't come to the meetings or, um, you know, not even just the small small group meetings, but a lot of people have missed um, good chunks of the uh, uh, of the monthly meetings. So um, if they're not providing a uh, explanation for their no for their no votes, um, I don't think it's I don't think their uh, opinions are coming from uh, a place where they're fully informed. That's I think it's I don't know. It would be important to uh, to get their uh, impressions of why they voted no. That's all. Thanks, Mike. Guthrie. Um, I just generally want to push back on the idea that the state agency reps need thirty days to do this. This is a people's task force, not a state agency task force. If it goes against sort of the the rules um, that we want to abide by, I get that. But um, if state agency reps need 30 days to make up their minds, I don't agree with that. Well, so so hearing that and given that we are allowing people to vote by email, um, if we have kind of more of a refinement of the language of these two recommendations for removing criminal penalties on the Thursday working group, then maybe we can send out and just have people re-vote over email. How do people feel about that? I, sorry, I didn't raise my hand. Um, I think it's better to do a roll call vote while we're all here than email votes because half the people won't respond. You're not going to get 21 people participating. That's my thought. Okay. Do any state agencies want to speak up around the logistics of this and whether you could participate at this time? If we were to kind of workshop this language and do a roll call by vote yet, Jess? And I don't know if there's time. <laughs> Uh, we have lost a few people from the meeting. They've had to leave. So um, we don't have as many people as we had when we started. So folks, if we do vote, folks, I'll still have to do the email vote for a few additional people. Yeah, so maybe we can do a quick raise of hands. Who wants to re-vote right now? Use the um, are we re-voting on? I mean, this feels like really rushed and hurried. Well, that's what I'm trying to get a sense of. Is like it feels yeah. like we're trying to refine the language of those first two removing decriminal removing criminal penalties around kind of which one to include the the natural mushrooms in. And some people wanting to vote right now. I'm recognizing that some people need more time to consult with agencies. We're in the last 15 minutes of our allotted time for this meeting. <laughs> so yeah. I'm not sure what we can do, Kit, and then go three. And I'm just raising my hand as part of the wanting to vote. <laughs> Sorry. Mine was also up there for the vote, but I think the clarification was uh, what we heard after the first no vote from the uh, first recommendation of separating out psilocybin mushrooms from the synthetically derived psilocybin as well as MDMA and LSD. We want to avoid sort of the meth fentanyl crisis that we see in that space and this space. Um, and that's what I'm recommending is that we rephrase uh, uh, broad recommendation one to be solely for uh, uh, psilocybin grown mushrooms. So how do other folks, Jeremy, how do you feel about voting on that right now? I mean, I'm not comfortable voting on that right now. I don't know. Ken has his hand up. I mean, you know, so yeah, I mean, I would vote no on that. Yeah, Ken and Helen. Yeah, we have plenty of time on those of us representing state agencies. We, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, we all have uh, people we work for and constituencies that we work for rather than just our own individual voice. So. Last time we had plenty of time to uh, make informed decisions, and I don't see a need to rush into it in the last 15 minutes here because we changed the wording. Yeah, thanks, Ken. Helen? 
Uh, and I would just say, I think it's always better to have the precise language so you know exactly what you're voting for. Um, and, you know, it's in the abstract now. And so I think having it reduced to writing is good. We can then get it back and make sure that we vet it uh, appropriately. How does that sound, Guthrie? Is that, or Adam and then? But, you know, uh, the state wants to do what the state wants to do. And, and I, I like I, I hear what Helen um, and Ken are saying, and we we have lost people since we voted on this at the beginning of the meeting. So just as a like procedural fairness issue, I get where they're coming from. Uh, one option would be to very precisely workshop the language on Thursday at our working group, and and then get that language out to all of the task force members so they can consult, consult with their leadership consult their constituencies would it be too late to vote on october 7 that'll be our next meeting with our timeline i mean i personally no, we can still vote and we can still vote on stuff in october and november if we have to yeah and this is really around the language right that of this recommendation i don't like i was saying before i don't think it impacts the research that would go into us starting to write the report because we need a first draft by the end of this month which will obviously be before we could have another official vote. Um, Guthrie, did you have something else you want to say? Um, I appreciate the the issues around language uh, and the time frame. I do want to point out for the state agency reps that those of us coming from com uh, community or tribal capacities, you know, we're here as volunteers. This isn't part of our paid position. Um, you know, creating undue uh, burden on the chair and others, I believe, is, you know, not a process that we want to be engaged in in regular practice. I agree. This probably won't change anybody's mind about voting today, just given the fact we had people drop off the call because we all have lives. Um, I just want to point out that, you know, this this was brought up late in the game about the abs abstentions um, and then, you know, being light and nimble. Um, you know, we're definitely not that in the moment. Um, and it's unfortunate. Thank you. Thank you, Guthrie. Helen, you have more to say? Mm -hmm. I do. Um, I, I just want to remind, uh, or just to, to Guthrie, to your point exactly, I certainly do appreciate, um, you know, the volunteer uh, nature of, of people who come to it who maybe aren't from a state agency. I certainly respect that uh, deeply. Uh, I would say, though, that one of the things that was talked about early on was the uh, responsibility to actually adhere to the current law. So um, this is not abstract. There is current law that is in place. And so um, state agencies or our agency, and I think perhaps all the rest, um, you know, have to make sure that we're being careful as that that's being applied. So that's just a, a good, you know, um, just you know, being good stewards of whatever responsibilities we have. And uh, I certainly don't, you know, want to um, diminish at all uh, the volunteer nature of what you do, but uh, it's no less important for those people who work for the state. Thank you, Helen. Anyone else have any thoughts or comments before we wrap up and adjourn for today? Caroline, was there anything more you wanted to talk about for the report writing? No, um, not, not exactly. Um, I guess one quick note, we do have the draft in the Teams folder. Um, it's in a template format, and Jess has also posted some writing guidelines. Um, so if you are writing, we would suggest you look through that. Um, but that's about it for me. Uh, Jessica, did you want to mention uh, that we did lose a member of the task force? Oh, right. So, um, yeah, we heard last night from Senator Scott Dibble that he was resigning from the task force. They didn't give a reason. Um, so we're down another member, but we also gained a new member in um, Rep Corrin. So we still have at least one Senate seat, but we unfortunately lost the one. So we're still not fully seated. But we would like to thank Senator Dibble for his engagement um, for the August meeting. And thank you so much for your time and energy towards helping the work of the task force. Mike, did you have something? I thought I saw you raise your hand. Yeah, I was just going to respond to Helen's. Um, um, we did discuss conflicts with existing law um, pretty thoroughly. So um, I don't know, maybe we can go back and 
review those notes or whatever, but uh, those those issues were addressed. That's why I'm, I'm kind of surprised that all the no votes and all the abstains. Uh, so uh, that's all I have to say. Yeah, I appreciate that, Mike. I think I think not to speak for Helen or anyone. I just think there's the the reality that this is all federally illegal, aside from you know doing clinical trials and and education campaigns, um, and to what extent we can move forward knowing that reality, right? Oregon and Colorado are doing it anyway, hoping that there's no appetite for the federal government to enforce it, but we don't really know. So I think you know keeping things grounded in the realities of the federal law and what we can sort of do as a state is really important and that landscape might change. It might look different in two years. So I think we just need to be cognizant of what's legal, what's possible, what's ethical, what's equitable. Um, it's an interesting space, an interesting topic um, that has potential and also a lot of risks. So I think we just need to navigate. I think, I think we're doing a good job. I'm happy with all the work that we've been doing. I really appreciate everyone's comments and feedback and input. Um, and understanding of boundaries and limitations. And so I just want to appreciate and thank all of you for all of your work. Uh, Renji. Yeah, thank you, Jessica. I wanted to just add on that, that we're all volunteers here. We joined this task force because we knew that we were going to sacrifice our time because the state of Minnesota and the people of Minnesota are counting on us to make thoughtful decisions. And I agree that we should wait on holding the vote because I think the people that are counting on us to make these decisions want us to perhaps flush this out. And that's exactly what we're doing right now. So I just want to, I appreciate everyone's recommendations and thoughts about this, but I agree taking a more thoughtful and, and, and measured approach and having the time to perhaps think about something that came up earlier on in a little bit more detailed and nuanced way uh, and more specific way is probably best for everyone, including the people that we are, you know, um, have chosen to volunteer to help. Thanks, Renji. Any other parting thoughts before we adjourn? Uh, this is Stacy. Just a reminder to everybody that the upcoming work group meetings always happen on the second and the fourth Thursday of each month, at least until otherwise noted. And the next full task force meeting is October 7th. All right, well, thank you everyone. Um, as always, you can join the working group meeting or contact and, um, either Jess or Stacy or myself over email. Um, thank you all for voting and taking time to <laughs> Uh, discuss this. I think there's a much more lively discussion than we've had in previous meetings. I love seeing engagement from additional people that don't usually chime in. So thank you all so much. Um, and with that, just want to thank the members, the observers on YouTube, uh, members of the public, and of course, our um, uh, facilitators, Stacy, Jess, and Nick, and MDH staff, Carrie and Caroline. Thank you all so much. Um, and with that, we'll adjourn for today. And we'll see you all back in a month on October 7th. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone.